tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. I'm more than a little OCD. Until this morning, I never saw this as a problem. I just have to prepare, take care of things, same as anyone else. Example, I have to have at least two of everything I might run out of. That way I know I'll never run out. I have two cans of shaving cream in the bathroom, two tubes of toothpaste, a spare toothbrush, and a spare shaving razor. If I should run one of my cans of shaving cream dry tomorrow morning, I'll know I have to go to the store. Here's another. I like my food in solid, uninterrupted colors. If I splatter ketchup or mustard on anything, I have to clean that shit up with a napkin, shake up the bottle, and try again. Generally, I have condiments on the side to avoid this calamity. As you can imagine, things like black-eyed peas would be impossible for me. And if I'm to have sprinkles on my ice cream, they have to be the same color as the ice cream itself. That goes for my caramel macchiato with sprinkles on top too. But here, I'm a little adventurous. Or I was this morning. Just the idea of putting those little sugar sprinkles on top is kind of risky. Since the drink changes from creamy white to dark honey brown just under the surface. And that's one very good reason. These things are served in paper cups and not glass or plastic. You don't have to see the colors mixing together. You just work your way down from one to the next without looking too much or overthinking it. So I took a chance when the barista offered me sprinkles, something I'd never even considered putting on my favorite hot drink before. <laughs> YOLO, I thought to myself, let's do this. But I have to have white sprinkles, of course. Because the top of a caramel macchiato is white. Problem was, as my barista explained, she only had sprinkle shakers in multiple colors. I told her I'd pass on the sprinkles then. No big deal. Thanks for the suggestion. She gave me that long-suffering look that non-OCD people reserve for people like me. She explained that there was virtually no difference between colored sprinkles and white ones. They're exactly the same. I was tempted to leave. I wanted to explain why I could only have white sprinkles, just so she'd understand. Leave me alone about it. I didn't need any sprinkles at all, really. I liked my caramel macchiato just fine without them. Instead, I clammed up and that made an awkward silence. And that made me panicky. So I said the only thing I could get out just then. Just white sprinkles, please. She sighed with anger, swept up the multicolored sprinkler shaker in one hand, and left with it behind the door that led to the back, abandoning her coworker to deal with the whole line of customers behind me by himself. I felt legit bad. I wanted to leave now more than ever. And the guy server told me I shouldn't have done that. He said that Courtney was super stubborn. I shrugged. I didn't even know her name was Courtney. But I couldn't leave. This was my coffee place. Right here. Nowhere else. If I left like this... I could never come back to it. So I stayed. And eventually, Courtney reemerged with the sprinkler shaker in one hand, within which I could not see a single white sprinkle, and a coffee filter in the other. She shook the filter under my nose. In it, I saw a small mound of only white sprinkles. She asked if I was happy now. 
I told her that I was. I got my caramel macchiato with white sprinkles, and I quite enjoyed it, for all of the walk home. I knew better than to look inside of it once I got a few sips in. And honestly, it didn't taste noticeably different with the new addition of sprinkles. It was a sweet drink to begin with. So in the end, I had nothing to complain about. But some of those sprinkles lingered in the bottom of the cup when I tossed it in the trash. That bugged me. It bugged me a lot. I'd just have to take the whole bag down to the trash, even though the bag was only half full. I let it go, though, because my stomach felt suddenly funny. In fact, it felt bad. And I was pretty much incapacitated for the rest of the day. Only started to clear up a little while ago. But that's not the worst thing. Usually, I don't see OCD as a problem. But half an hour ago, the sprinkles at the bottom of my coffee cup hatched. And now, something on the inside of my stomach tickles. It would just be for the summer, they said. Just until they worked some things out, they said. As the TV screen turned to static again, Eli was starting to think that summer might as well be forever. Grandma, the TV's broken again. Eli heard the clacking of Grandma's walker as the elderly woman slowly plodded into the room. She tutted her tongue before making her way over there. One of her wrinkled hands made a fist, and she proceeded to punch the top of the TV. The screen mostly cleared up, and the old woman looked over with a smug smile like, See? Ah, that's how it fixes, Grandma said in her shaky old voice before she and her walker meandered back to her bedroom. Eli sighed as he flopped back on the couch. Grandma's house didn't even have the internet, much less Netflix. The TV was so old that Eli was pretty sure Grandma got it when his mom was born, so it would keep fuzzing up. Somehow, Eli's punches weren't enough to fix it. Maybe he was hitting it in the wrong area, or his tiny, hundred-pound, soaking wet grandma was stronger than she looked. And all there was to watch were a dozen or so Disney videotapes. Not even any DVDs. Going outside wasn't much better. The nearest neighbors were this couple who had cornfields stretching out as far as Eli could see. The first few times it was fun running around the cornfields, but now it was just boring, boring, boring. No other kids to play with. No parks where he could run around. There was just no one to hang out with. You like to watch Frozen now? Other than his little brother, Oscar. But Oscar was seven, and Oscar was annoying. Eli glared down at the floor, where Oscar had managed to find a clean page in a wrinkled coloring book and was currently scrawling with his red crayon over the page. Oscar, do any of those tapes have Frozen on them? He asked. Oscar looked back down at his coloring book. No. Then no, we can't watch Frozen, obviously. This had to be the 18th time he'd asked that in a month. He'd also asked for Moana, and Cars, and The Incredibles. His brother had to be stupid. There was no way he'd already forgotten that the only movies they could watch were in that pile of VHS. There weren't even many Disney movies. The only two were Bambi, which was boring, and The Lion King, which they'd already watched like six times since they were dropped off here with two suitcases and their mom kissing their heads, with that stupid promise that they'd be back soon. So far, it was looking like another promise she'd forget. Soon meant a few weeks, not two months. What was he going to do when it was school, anyway? 
Grandma couldn't drive, and he'd need the internet to do his homework. Plus, he didn't want to go to school here. School here was probably as stupid as everything else. The TV went to static again, and Eli groaned. Fuck this TV. He grumbled quietly. Not quiet enough, clearly, as Oscar's head snapped up and he gasped. Eli, Graham said don't say that word. He said. Well, fuck Grandma. Eli, I'll tell. Fuck you, too. This was enough to upset Oscar, since he tore out of the room sobbing and calling for Grandma. Eli grumbled even more of his dad's favorite curse words before he got up and stormed out of the house, slamming the screen door behind him. He wasn't going to stick around for another of his grandma's broken English scoldings. Just slap him and get over it. Eli veered away from the cornfields and started for the trees. No doubt Oscar would go looking for him in the cornfields. There wasn't much of the woods he was allowed to explore, but he could at least get deep enough to throw his brother off. It was only a minute of tripping over brambles until he reached the edge of the woods, the edge that backed up to the swamp. Grandma didn't set down many ground rules, other than don't break things and clean your plate. But there was one rule she was very determined that Eli understood. Stay out of the swamp. There are spiders. She said this with such determination that Eli nearly flinched, expecting a whack to the back of the head to make sure it sunk in. But she hadn't hit him. At least, not yet. Eli plopped down on the ground and stared into the swamp. Spiders, though? There weren't any super deadly spiders around here. He knew that. He actually kinda liked spiders. They weren't all that scary. Daddy Longlegs, which weren't really spiders, but close enough, lived under his old bed at his house. Maybe wherever his grandmother came from had a poisonous spider species, but that was no big deal here. So clearly, Grandma was overreacting. But it still felt like there was an invisible fence that prevented Eli from taking a single step into the swamp. A yellow garden spider was currently chilling in the weeds next to him, and Eli watched as it repaired its web, spinning silk into that classic spider design. Maybe his grandma was arachnophobic. She was just scared of all spiders. But how could a spider be scary? That was something that never made sense to Eli. I bet it's a lot funner to be a spider than be a kid stuck here. Eli thought aloud. The spider didn't respond, but it wasn't like Eli expected it to. Eli, Eli, where are you? Eli cringed as he saw his brother crashing through the underbrush. I'm right here. Stop yelling and slow down. You'll step on the spider, he said as he got up. Spider where? Now, Oscar was definitely arachnophobic. Eli snickered as he saw his little brother jumping up and down, swatting at his arms and looking like he was about to cry. You're such a baby. Let's go back to Grandma's, he said as he strode away from the garden spider in the edge of the swamp. Grandma said you're not supposed to go in the swamp, Oscar said in his know-it-all voice once Eli was caught up to him. Well, f don't say that. Eli huffed. Well, I wasn't in the swamp, so if you tell Grandma that I was... You're a liar. Oscar pouted, but at least he stopped trying to act all bratty. All he did since they got here was whine and complain about everything. He missed mom. He missed their dog Buster. Eli wasn't allowed to do this or say that. He wanted to watch a movie they clearly didn't have. If their dad was there, Oscar would get whacked real good for being such a little shit. Then again, the... Whackings is what got them sent here in the first place. Grandma was serving some sort of disgusting meatloaf onto plates at the dinner table when Eli and Oscar got back to the house. Oscar wrinkled his nose at the sight. Grandma, that's gross. He proclaimed. Good for you. She said as she spooned out some green beans as well. Grossest vegetable green beans. 
But Grandma always said clean your plate, so Eli plopped down in his chair and begrudgingly began to eat. The loaf was as tasteless and chewy as it looked, but Eli just grabbed the ketchup bottle and drowned it in the ketchup. He'd do the same to the green beans, but that just made that intolerable vegetable even worse. Oscar's bottom lip trembled as he looked at his plate. I don't want it, he said. Grandma sighed. Eat two bites. I'll make sandwich, she said as she got up from her chair. See, if Eli pulled that, he'd just get told to suck it up. Well, maybe not in such rude terms, but he was too old to whine and complain about a sandwich. But kicking up a fuss about it didn't work either, so Eli just kept the ketchup bottle right next to his plate. After dinner, Eli headed to his room, wanting to be alone, but Oscar was right on his heels. Can we play? No. Oscar scowled. I'll tell Grandma we're going in the swamp. He snapped. That swamp. Eli curled his lip. Maybe I will go next time, since you're such a baby and scared of spiders, he said. Oscar puffed his chest out, trying to look bigger than he really was. Sure, leave me alone, or else I'll go into the swamp and get some of those spiders and I'll put them in your bed. That threat was taken seriously, as Oscar bolted into the living room to join Grandma in watching her game shows. After dinner, Grandma had control over the TV, and the one channel she got had all the old trivia and guessing shows on it. Eli couldn't care less about those stupid shows, so he slammed the door to his bedroom and flopped down on his bed. That was an idea, though, wasn't it? Go out to the swamp, have some time for himself. Sure, he'd be bored, but at least he'd be alone. Grandma couldn't get out that far on her walker, and Oscar was too scared. And who knows? Maybe Eli would find something cool, like animal bones or a species of spider he'd never seen before. That was settled then. Tomorrow, he'd go out to the swamp and check it out, free from grandmas and whiny baby brothers. The next morning was fine enough. Eli ate his mostly cooked pancakes. Oscar found another stash of untouched coloring books in the attic, so he was content to let Eli control the TV. And one of Grandma's neighbors brought over some of their old videotapes, so Eli finally got some different movies to watch. But Eli knew sooner or later Oscar would get bored, and he'd be stuck with his obnoxious little brother hanging off his arm. So... That afternoon, he waited for Oscar to go to the bathroom before he made a break for it. He didn't even tell Grandma he was going out. She was probably napping right now anyway. Eli tromped through the woods, courageous until he reached the edge of the swamp. He almost took a step into it when he froze. The hair on his neck prickled, and he told himself to move his foot again, but he just couldn't make himself do it. All that previous bravado had vanished, his grandmother's warning repeating itself again and again in his head. Stay out of the swamp. There are spiders. He took a step back and away from the swamp, almost ready to turn and go back to the house. What would be so interesting in a gross old swamp anyway? Eli, Eli, are you here? Well... Eli knew what wasn't in that swamp. Little brothers, no doubt wanting to ask about another movie they didn't have, or to play some stupid game with him. Before Eli could doubt himself any longer, he bolted into the swamp, away from Oscar calling for him. The soil under his feet went from firm to soft, each footstep sinking into the earth just a little bit. Pools of water and weeds that went up to his shoulders surrounded him, and, in a minute, that was all that was around. Any trees that were around were short and scrawny, more like bushes than trees. Several had toppled over, their roots still deep in the mushy ground, but snapped or cracked in the trunks. 
Eli could hear the croaking of bullfrogs and something flopping around in the water. And, much to his surprise, there wasn't a single damn spider in sight. Eli laughed with relief. So his grandma was just nuts. Sure, he was a bit disappointed he wouldn't find any spiders back here, but at least this place wasn't infested with black widows or something. Now he could really explore. The boy took off with a whoop, nearly throwing himself into one of the murky ponds in his excitement. He only caught himself at the last second, giggling up a storm before he took off deeper into the swamp. Maybe it was the forbidden part of it all, but the swamp was far more interesting than the cornfields or the backyard. That, and there was no Oscar. No one back here at all, not even a house in sight. Eli threw himself to his knees to get a better look at the shallow pools of water. They seemed extra full. Eli imagined it was from the rain a few days ago. Not much was inside of them, save for a few tadpoles and water skeeters zipping around the surface. But it was fun to try and scoop a few of them up. He got close to grabbing a tadpole once or twice, but he never actually managed to get one in his hand. No doubt it was the tadpole catching that sucked away the afternoon. His growling stomach dragged him back into reality. The sky was dimming, and the skyline was starting to turn orange. Eli got back up to his feet, doing his best to brush the mud off of his jeans. There was nothing to do about his shoes. They were soaked through. Grandma wasn't stupid. She'd know where he'd been. But it didn't matter. She was a crazy old lady who only came into his life because his dad sent him and Oscar to school with a black eye apiece. No amount of excuses could hide the truth this time. This time, they knew what had happened. Eli was about halfway back when he heard Oscar yelling his name. Eli! Eli! Grandma's upset! Get back here! Eli ground his teeth as he made sure to drag his feet as he headed towards Oscar's voice. It wasn't too hard to find him. He was screaming himself hoarse. Calm down, you baby. I'm fine. What's for dinner? Eli asked as he walked up to Oscar. Oscar immediately threw himself at Eli, tightly wrapping his arms around his older brother. Eli, I've been looking for you forever. Why are you back here? Grandma's so scared. He sobbed. Get off! All of the earlier anger and frustration exploded at that moment, and Eli shoved Oscar off, right into one of those muddy pools of water. So annoying! I went in there to get away from you! Oscar looked up, his eyes all puffy and red from crying, and his face now splattered with mud. His bottom lip trembled, and a tear rolled down his cheek. He looked so pathetic, sitting in that puddle with mosquitoes starting to swarm over his head. Something clenched in Eli's chest, something he didn't like. He turned away from Oscar. Let's just go to Grandma's, he growled. Hurry and get up. Eli, there's a spider. Oh, for fuck's sake. There's no spiders out there, you stupid. Eli turned back to his brother, and his voice caught in his throat as he saw that his brother's face had gone white as a sheet, and he was pointing right behind Eli. The hair on Eli's neck stood up as he heard the squelching of mud and a crack that could be compared to someone standing on a branch. He slowly turned around. In the dark, it was so much easier to see the swamp for what it was. Broken branches became legs. Patches of grass and weeds became a round body. Sticky mud and water became webbing. 
a piece of the ground stood up on those broken branch legs and made a watery hiss. Spider, you spider! Eli couldn't move. He couldn't breathe. He just watched as the spider walked towards him, hissing again as each step sounded like a crack. Eli! Oscar's hand roughly grabbed Eli's and pulled him so hard it nearly took him off balance, but it was what Eli needed to snap out of it. A warbling scream ripped its way out of his throat as the pair of boys took off into the swamp, running away from the spider that was now chasing the both of them. You gotta hurry, Eli, hurry. Oscar's fingernails dug sharply into Eli's wrist. Where's Grandma? I... Eli whipped his head around, trying to see something familiar, but the sun seemed to set in the blink of an eye. He couldn't see anything familiar now. I don't know. Just keep going. What the hell was that thing? The swamp that had seemed so relaxed and fun in the daylight was now a maze of terror. Every few steps, Eli was tripping over a branch or sticking his foot in a mud puddle. Around the third puddle, he lost a shoe. The mud sucked it into the ground and he just ended up yanking his foot out of it rather than stick around and become swamp spider lunch. His sock-covered foot was quickly soaked in icy water, his toes going numb, but he continued to run. He knew he was doomed when his sock caught on another broken branch and pulled his leg out from under him. He face-planted hard into the ground, mud getting into his mouth and eyes. He levered himself up as best he could and opened the one eye that didn't have dirt in it. Oscar had frozen in front of Eli, his little brother gasping for breath. Oscar, go! Keep going! Eli could hear the swamp spider behind him getting closer, each crackling step louder and spelling his doom. It was all his fault anyway. Maybe Oscar could get back to Grandma's if the spider was distracted by snacking on Eli. Oscar stepped back, nearly tripping over his own feet, his eyes so wide with fear they looked ready to pop out of his head. A branch-like leg stepped on the back of Eli's leg, and he closed his eyes, hoping the spider had venom or something to make it quick. Leave my brother alone, you dick! Eli heard something squall, and he reopened his eyes to see Oscar beating the swamp spider away with a stick. He'd never seen his little brother so enraged, wildly swinging the branch around and sending the spider scuttling back. Eli scrambled to his feet and limped away, hope entering his chest. He was never going to refuse to play with Oscar again, not ever. They were going to run away from the stupid spider and get back to Grandma's, where they'd watch whatever movies Oscar wanted, and play games, and… Oscar's blood-curdling scream filled the air and Eli spun around to see that the spider had lunged, its twig-like mandibles burying themselves in Oscar's leg. Oscar dropped the branch and tried to shove the spider off, his mouth still twisted in that horrible scream. Something snapped in Eli's mind, and he lunged at the spider, stomping both of his legs into its earth back. He knew he was cussing, he knew he was screaming, but it didn't matter. He didn't get off the spider until it finally released Oscar. Oscar dropped to the ground, far too still and pale for this to be any good. Eli jumped off the spider and scooped his brother up running in a direction and praying it was the right one. God finally chose to be kind as Eli spotted the trees of the forest. He could hear the cracking of the spider's legs behind him, but he didn't stop until they burst past the tree line. Eli dropped then, 
gasping for breath and clutching his brother to his chest. Finally, when Eli caught his breath, he sat up to look at Oscar. Oscar's eyes were closed, and even though it was dark, Eli could see his leg was a bloody, mud-coated mess. Eli whimpered and gave Oscar's shoulder a shake. Oscar, are... are you okay? Slowly, Oscar's eyes fluttered open. There was something wrong about them, but Eli couldn't put his finger on what was wrong. I feel different. Eli swallowed as Oscar pulled his injured leg to his chest. Oscar, we need to go back to Grandma's. She can make it all better. No, she can't. It's no better. Oscar shuddered. Just stay here, okay? It was over. Please. Eli scooted closer to Oscar and pulled his little brother into his lap. He was so cold to the touch, his body twitching in strange ways. I can stay. I can stay as long as you like. Oscar, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for hiding from you. I'm so sorry. I know you didn't mean it. You miss home too. Oscar's stiff fingers brushed against Eli's face, a sleepy smile playing across his face. I love you, Eli. Eli stared down at Oscar, realizing all at once what was wrong. Oscar's eyes were black now. Pure black. Other black speckles that he had originally thought was mud wasn't mud. It was more eyes. Just like a spider's. It took the entire night for the transformation to be over. Eli got so cold he hurt and his stomach was hollow, but he wasn't going to leave Oscar like this. His brother's face contorted and sprouted grass, along with a dozen more eyes and twig-like mandibles from the corner of his mouth. His t-shirt tore off when new arms sprouted out, arms with a bark-like texture and claws at the end. He shrunk, he grew, and by the time it was bright outside, Eli was cuddled up to a piece of swamp. The swamp spider in his lap purred and rubbed its head against Eli's fingers before it finally got off of Eli, ambling its way into the swamp. Eli nearly jumped out of his skin as he realized that the spider that had likely attacked them earlier had been waiting in the swamp the entire night. Oscar chirped at the larger spider, who chirped back. The larger spider ambled off into the swamp, with Oscar trotting after it. And then, it was just a swamp. A swamp with strangely broken trees and tall patches of grass. Serial killers have always fascinated me. Ever since I was a kid, I found myself both scared and intrigued by psychos like Ted Bundy or Clementine Barnabit. And as I grew older, my interest only increased. I was from Atlanta, growing up in lower-class Latino neighborhoods. I'd seen crime all the time. I saw gangs, drugs, violence. Basically, a first-hand glimpse into real-world terror. Life wasn't always perfect. Not when I had no siblings and only my skinny mother to protect me. By thirteen, I was bitter, angry. I didn't want sappy BS to cheer me up. I wanted something darker, more realistic. So in time, serial killers became my hobby. All the while, my mom fought hard as a single mother against the plight of life. She won. Now I just had to make sure her victory wasn't for naught. So here I was. I, Michael Sanchez, was on the verge of being the first college graduate in my family. Just one more semester, 
and I'd be done here at Georgia State, my bachelor's degree in English complete. I really wanted to be a writer, and you guessed it, a true crime writer. My capstone project was to even be a basis for my first book, an exploration into the homes of Georgia's most infamous serial killers. Yeah, I kind of got the idea from the 1993 movie California. By the time Christmas break rolled around, my girlfriend Amy and I had already visited close to ten of those homes, all around Georgia, from Atlanta to Cordell, but now we were going further south than ever before, almost to the Florida line, Stanwyck, Georgia. For a relatively small town, Stanwyck had its fair share of violence, maybe the highest murder rate per capita in the entire state. We were there to check out two particular locations, Jack Bates' old house and a derelict apartment building called Sunnyside. Sunnyside was a shambling two-story eyesore. Hell, I think it only had four apartments for rent. But the place was home to more than just roaches. It was also home to Clay Fowler, a bigot, a rapist, and murderer. The Stanwyck Slayer, as he was called by the press. Fowler was 35 by the time Apartment B was raided during the early 70s. Inside, police found the remains of all of his victims, dozens of them found not as corpses or bodies, but just as pieces of flesh and organs. All the pieces had been incorporated into his apartment's interior. They were sewn or nailed into all the furniture and walls. There was even a flesh-covered coffee table. Like a deranged home decorator, Clay had used his victims for Apartment B's makeover. With the aid of his trusted fillet knife, he flawlessly blended the skin and bone into his home with meticulous precision. The cleanest apartment Sunnyside had ever seen. Everything was said to be so smooth and soft, except for the occasional fleshy lump. Clay had mostly been preying on children attending a nearby middle school. Most of his victims, black, Considering his disgusting racism, Clay's location deep in the heart of Stanwyck's slums must have been a happy convenience for him. And like a monster of the mornings, he'd usually abduct the kids around dawn. Additionally, he'd also kill whichever adults got too close to Apartment B, even a couple of his own neighbors from Apartment A. From what I've read... Police were criticized for not investigating as thoroughly as they should have, an all-too-common reality, whenever minorities and lower-class citizens went missing, something I was used to growing up in my poor neighborhoods. Ultimately, Fowler got sentenced to life without parole, and to this day, the Stanwyck Slayer is still rotting behind bars. I imagine most of y'all are probably wondering what the hell I got out of exploring the homes of the likes of Fowler. Honestly, these journeys weren't all about my project. They satisfied my passion, my obsession. Just being in these morbid locations grounded the tragedies for me. They painted historical markers for their murderers and their victims, and ultimately, I viewed them as symbolic gravestones for such horrible crimes. So, on December 20th, Amy and I left my mom's place. I promised to be back by Christmas Eve at the latest. After all, I'd never miss the holidays with Mama. Plus, I was going to bring her back a Stanwyck souvenir like I did always on these trips. The pretty drive was a four-hour journey through the rural American South. Amy and I had a blast, like always. She considered it an early Christmas present for me, and I couldn't ask for anything better. We were a quirky but cute couple, both of us black-haired and brown-eyed Latinos, both of us with hipster haircuts and eccentric clothes, both of us from tough, poor neighborhoods. But Amy was much tougher than me, not to mention more muscular compared to me and my developing beer belly. We'd bonded in American Lit over Edgar Allan Poe, two outsiders in a college where everyone else considered us weird as, well, you know what. 
But we didn't need them, or the party scene. We had each other. Horror movies, and our shared interest in serial killers. By four o'clock we reached Stanwick. I wouldn't say the town was tiny, nor big. Just an average all-American city. A Walmart in a great high school football team. A high school team that had just won a state championship, too. Plus, the city's Christmas lights were glorious, like a holiday Vegas. Such a warm greeting for a town notorious to all us true crime enthusiasts like Amy and I. There were the clean city streets, the cute country homes, the countless fast food chains. Overall, Stanwick looked just comfortable. However, the closer we got to Sunnyside, we noticed the gradual shift from pleasant Stanwick to downtrodden, slummy Stanwick. West Stanwick, to be exact. The area was more industrial rather than scenic, and with it came a conglomeration of lower-class neighborhoods and public housing, Sunnyside Apartments amongst them. The roads got bumpier. The houses became more unappealing. The Christmas lights now resembled shabby hand-me-downs. West Stanwick felt like a safer incarnation of the mean streets Amy and I had grown up on. Soon we passed the middle school, and what a brick mess it was. A faded sign out front read, West Stanwick Middle School, home of the owls. The sign's owl character would have been more at home in a 1960s cartoon. So would the school, for that matter. Much like the West Side's Christmas lights, Stanwick Middle resembled yet another indifferent hand-me-down from the city. And the neighborhoods around the school weren't much better, almost all public housing, all full of poverty and urban decay. Small Town America's rendition of my inner city, Atlanta Hill. In a few blocks, we finally reached our destination and pulled up into Sunnyside's ruptured parking lot. My Toyota was the only car here, no nearby neighbors save for a shack or two. A Stanwick Middle School bus stop was right across the street, yet another unfortunate convenience for Fowler. Woods of tall trees and spiraling ivy were on all sides of the two-story building, the property long overgrown, almost as if Sunnyside had become a dark forest in the middle of town. The apartment's white stone structure was about as appealing as a funeral home. Once I saw the rickety metal stairway, I was glad apartment B was on the ground floor. Even in the early evening, I found it strange there weren't any cars or people around, as if the abandoned Sunnyside had been quarantined from the rest of town. Even a black eye for this lower-class neighborhood. Holding hands, Amy and I walked toward B. Both of us struggled to stay warm in our hoodies, the harsh breeze about as vicious as Fowler's fillet knife. We were ready for our inspection. She had the camera. I had my iPhone out, ready to type down my thoughts. Well, Amy and I's thoughts. In many ways, this was our project. I pulled my hoodie in closer, a weak attempt to stave off the bitter cold. As we passed apartment A, I stole a look through its large windows. I could see stray furniture inside, even trash and cigarette butts on the wool carpeting. Regardless of the tacky color, the room's blue walls looked fresh rather than ancient. Exciting, Amy murmured. I know, I said. I squeezed her hand like an excited kid clinging to their parent before entering their first haunted house. I bet they probably couldn't clean all of it. Chuckling, Amy gave me a light punch. That's terrible, Michael. I mean, it'd be pretty damn tough. The bitch had people everywhere. Even sewn into the couch, right? Like a confident professor, I looked right at her. Correct. We stopped at the black door the crooked letter B hung on it. Scratches and chipped paint accompanying the rusty doorknob. Cracked glass was on all the nearby windows... Somehow this place was never rumored to be haunted, I realized. Amy took a pick of the door. She flashed me a smile. 
You ready? Yeah, I replied. Cautious, I reached toward the door, then hesitated. Even in the daylight, trespassing almost got me nervous. I stole a look around us, even though I knew not a soul was around. And deep down, I knew no one would care anyway, not even small-town cops. I got it, Amy quipped. Turning, I saw her go ahead and snag the doorknob. To our surprise, the knob moved with effortless precision. One smooth turn, and Amy let it creak open. Well, that was easy, I commented. Grinning, Amy snapped a photo of me. I couldn't help but smirk. Using the camera, Amy waved me inside. After you, sexy. From there, we entered apartment B. The front door slammed shut right behind us in a ferocious flourish. Of course, I jumped. And of course, Amy laughed her ass off. You already scared? She teased. I threw up my arms. We're only in the home of one of George's most prolific serial killers. Not our first time, Michael. Amused, I hugged her close and gave her a kiss. Come on, I said. And then we got to work. Even with all the lights out, sunshine beamed in through all the windows to light the place up like a stage. Not that there was much to light up. Most of the apartment was a big living room. There was an old torn couch, a few blankets thrown about, even a bulky TV. No flush was on any of this, of course. Plenty of stains and trash covered the scruffy carpet, not to mention the carpet was more ruptured than the parking lot. A small kitchen was connected to the living room, just an oven and a tall fridge, not even room for a damn table. Expecting a cold cave, I was surprised by the room's cozy warmth, as if all the squatters had set up a fireplace for the holidays. But I could still feel the isolation in here, even in the city limits. Apartment B was a lonely place, all ugly blandness inside and all ugly poverty outside. I couldn't help but be reminded of my old neighborhoods, places Mama and I used to live. I bet Fowler spent plenty of long nights in this room, both from killing and out of boredom. There was seclusion in Apartment B's walls. Maybe being trapped in here was the final push toward the Stanwyck Slayer's killing spree. Then I realized an even creepier thought. What if Fowler was planning the murders all along, specifically against the black race he hated? This wouldn't be a lonely place then, but a coveted spot for his evil. As she took photos with the artistry of a Snapchatter turned crime photographer, Amy pointed toward the walls. They were blood red rather than blue. I guess they painted it that in case they missed something, she joked. Smiling, I nodded. <laughs> Wouldn't be surprised. Stopping near the TV, I saw that all the walls were red. I knew it was paint, but still, it felt like Amy and I had stumbled upon a recreation of the scene shocked officers had found in here over forty years ago. Red walls made of Clave's victims, flesh and blood, not to mention the human smorgasbord that was his furniture. This was Ed Gein in overdrive. Like an intense reporter, Amy took countless photos, and I did my best to type up notes on my phone. Turning, I noticed a tight hallway led from the living room to a few closed doors. I figured a bedroom and bathroom. The hallway resembled a claustrophobic tunnel, claustrophobic just like the rest of the crappy apartment. Stopping near me, an excited Amy pointed toward a shelf standing by the couch. One of the ripped-up sofa arms had obscured the sight. Hey, check that out, she said. Intrigued, I followed her over to the shelf. On top of it stood two modest picture frames. Through the cracked glass, each frame showed a lesbian couple in their mid-thirties, attractive but clearly lower class, grungy clothes and hairstyles, countless piercings. The taller one was a white girl with green eyes and long blonde hair, the other an African-American with a sexy faux hawk. Who are they? Amy asked. 
Probably the last renters, I said. Amy took closer shots of both pips. Smirking, I looked back at all the red walls. Now that I was this close, the paint did look quite fresh. Probably back when rent was a hundred a month. Laughing, Amy confronted me. Uh, even that's too much. Through the windows I saw the sunlight fading into night. The apartment was getting darker and creepier. Just how Amy and I liked it. Like a morbid museum that retained a curious mystique by day but became absolutely terrifying once the lights went out. Come on, I said. With that, I led the way toward the hallway, toward those doors. Amy stayed close, with the constant soundtrack. I kept hearing her camera go off. You think we'll find anything? she asked. I flashed her a grin. I sure hope not. The hallway was even darker than the living room, no windows for comfort, like we were going further within the cave that was apartment B. Both doors were black and looked older than slabs of stone, the knobs long conquered by rust. I snagged the first one, but it was locked. Stunned, I kept turning the knob to no avail. What the hell? I muttered. Why is it locked? Amy asked, incredulous. Weird. The entire apartment got darker and darker, as if Sunnyside Apartments was getting near closing time, yet Apartment B was still warm. Sure, the building was shelter from the cold, but this was constant heat. There was no cool breeze seeping in, or a dormant draft for that matter. I wonder what the last tenants were hiding. Amy quipped in a cryptkeeper tone. Grinning, I looked at her warm smile. Hey, we can dream, right? She commented. Why not? Ready to explore, I grabbed the other doorknob, but it wouldn't budge. Both doors were locked tight. Annoyed, I pounded on the hard door. The hits hurt me more than anything, like I was banging on concrete. Crap! I yelled as I drew my hand back. Chuckling, Amy pulled me back. Nice try, doofus. I confronted the door, frustrated I couldn't see what secrets lied behind it. I think there's a window out back, Amy said. With the sudden fright of a blaring police siren, the front door swung open. Oh, crap! I exclaimed. Scared, uh, crapless, Amy and I turned to see a couple enter from the dark night. Two laughing females, their drunken laughter, reminiscent of hyenas. I felt Amy's nervous hand grab my shoulder. Full of dread, I wrapped my arm around her and pulled her in close. There we stood in the dark like uneasy soldiers. One quick flip and the living room lights cut on. Loud humming bulbs illuminated the apartment like a clinical lab. The two girls were the lesbian couple from the photos. A strange couple. In addition to the piercings, they wore punk clothing. Ripped jeans and T-shirts, tight black leather jackets. The faux hawk girl carried two large brown grocery bags, overfilled bags, like an all-American family shopping spree gone mad. Still chuckling, the blonde woman stumbled over toward the kitchen. Neither woman had seen us yet. My mind was at a panicked blank. What the hell were we going to do? Apparently Amy had an idea, stepping away from me. Amy approached the two women. I'm sorry, Amy said, her voice apologetic yet strong. I followed her. Yeah, I felt weird, but I wasn't going to let my girlfriend go alone. Surprised, the Fauxhawk girl flashed us an amused smile. Oh, hi there. She placed the grocery bags on the couch. I heard the fridge opening in the kitchen, the sound of drinks and food being pushed around. Together, Amy and I stopped in the living room. Awkward, as always. Like we'd crashed an upscale party, rather than just broken into a crappy apartment. Oh, we're so sorry. Amy went on, doing her best to suppress her unease. We didn't know anyone lived here. Holding a can of... Paps Blue Ribbon, the tall blonde stopped next to her girlfriend. A wicked smile dominated the blonde's haggard face. 
Well, look what the cat drug in. I know, her girlfriend said. We've got visitors. Pretty ones, too. The blonde took a long sip, savoring the cheap booze. The couple's smiles were confident but warm, like proud hostesses. Keeping her cool, Amy took a calm step toward them. I'm sorry, we came here because we heard this was where the Stanwyck Slayer lived. The blonde's bright eyes lit up. Oh, Clay Fowler, right? Yes. Gathering my nerves, I stopped next to Amy. Yeah, this was his apartment, right, I asked. Apartment B. Yeah, the blonde went on. She took another compulsive sip like it was a dose of prescribed medicine. Mrs. Barrymore warned us about it when we moved in. Our landlord, Fohawk, chimed in. Amy and I released nervous chuckles. Warned y'all? I joked like an anxious comedian. I stole a glance around the room. He's not still here, is he? The blonde laughed. No, not at all, man. That bitch has been gone. Grinning, her girlfriend motioned toward Amy's camera. What's that for? Y'all trying to do an interview? The blonde teased. Like a documentary, Fohawk added. Hiding her nerves better than I ever could, Amy held up the camera. We were just taking pictures. Honestly, we really thought Sunnyside was abandoned. Yeah, I added. We were trying to explore the houses of different famous serial killers. Oh, shit! The blonde exclaimed. Excited, her girlfriend hit her in the shoulder. That's so cool! I'm honestly surprised no one's been around here before, I said. I mean, this is like history. Mm-hmm, Amy said. Like a smug celebrity on a photo shoot, the blonde draped her arm over her girl. One hand on her girlfriend, the other hand on her PBR. All that was missing was a cigarette. Well, we don't worry about it too much, the blonde stated. She exchanged smiles with the faux hawk. Rent's cheap and we're together. Her beaming eyes confronted Amy and I. That's all that matters. I understand, Amy said. Again, I'm sorry we barged in like this. Like a pathetic, apologetic suburban dad, I forced a chuckle. Clark Griswold himself would have cringed. Yeah, I thought it was a little too warm in here to be abandoned. Laughing, Fohawk faced her partner. Oh my God, did you leave the heat on again? The blonde waved her can toward the front door. Well, you're the one that left the damn door open. Well, we should have probably leave, Amy said. I'm sorry about all this. Eager, I joined Amy. Yeah. Using her PBR like a baton, the blonde kept us at bay. Whoa. Y'all ain't taking nothing now, are you? Her girlfriend grabbed her arm. Babe. No, I'm serious, Chris, Blonde interrupted. She focused her stoic stare on us. They were just messing around in her apartment. I promise we didn't, Amy said. Chris wrapped her arm around the Blonde. You locked the bedroom, remember? True, the Blonde admitted. Trying to leave the awkward situation, Amy exchanged nervous looks with me. Well, we really should get going. But the couple didn't budge. Like a human blockade, they stayed in front of the doorway. Chris's curious eyes stayed focused on us. Fowler was the one who killed all the black kids, right? With a fillet knife or some... some... Yeah, terrible, I said. Like a mob boss, the blonde took another cool sip. So why are you all so interested in them? I felt the couple's stares pierce into us like daggers. Well, I stammered. Turning, I saw Amy's annoyed glare strike me with ferocity. It's for this project, Amy said. Yeah, I'm doing a book on serial killers, about their homes and houses and stuff. I waved towards Amy. She's taking the pictures and helping me. Smiles cracked through the couple's stoic facades. Oh, how cute, the blonde teased. Y'all know about Jack Bates, too, right? Chris asked us. Amy grinned. Of course. Yeah, we're going to stop at his place next, I said. Like a rebellious teenager that was too cool for school, the blonde let out a smug chuckle. 
Oh, man, plenty of weirdos in this town. Not even counting us, Chris joked. Yeah, that's what I've heard, I said. With forceful apology, Amy pulled me toward the door. Well, it was nice meeting you all, Amy said to the couple. Oh, yeah, you too, Chris replied. Unlike the blonde, Chris stepped out of the way, just enough space for us to clear out of apartment B. Turning, I faced the couple. I'm sorry about everything. No, nah, you're fine, Chris said in a warm tone. Bye. Like a confident cop, the blonde's eyes and smirk stayed on me. Take care, she said with a sardonic sharpness. Amy and I stepped out into the furious cold. The temperature had dropped even further since we went into the apartment. As if she was shuddering us into a chest freezer, Chris closed the door behind us. The powerful effects of Apartment B's heater were now gone without a trace. Desperate to stay warm, I hugged Amy close. Well, that was fun. A little too exciting, Amy said with a laugh. Together, we started walking back to my Toyota. The howling breeze kept hitting us in waves. Amy jammed her hands in her hoodie's pockets, camera included. I guess I'll have to do more research next time, I said. My eyes drifted over toward one of Apartment B's many windows. Nah, that's my bad, Amy said. Not saying a word, I came to a horrified stop. The combination of the cold and my own extreme fear cemented me in place. Startled, Amy looked at me. Michael? But I couldn't answer. My eyes were captivated by the sight inside Apartment B. Through the windows, I could see the lesbian couple emptying the grocery bags onto the couch like open Christmas presents. Right on the sofa fell a grisly collection. Blood-red gifts. Severed human limbs. Pulpy organs. The two women looked excited and thrilled, like bank robbers evaluating their stolen loot. Only this was stolen, slaughtered lives. I felt Amy's terrified hand snatch my arm, her grip colder than the December air. Then, when Chris and the blonde both looked up at us, their eyes looked colder than death. My soul became twisted in knots, especially once the couple gave Amy and I those wicked smiles. The two of them looked so happy, even with the scattered gore all over their bodies and drenched across the ugly sofa. They had the enthusiastic spirit of Clay Fowler and the enthusiastic evil of Apartment B. Come on! The frightened Amy yelled through the cold. I felt her yank my arm out of its socket, but it was the wake-up call I needed. Snapping out of my frozen fear, I followed Amy toward the Toyota, all the way through the slicing cool air. The door to Bartman B burst open like gunfire through the quiet night. Scared, I turned and saw the couple run after us. Each of them held a long fillet knife, just like Clay Fowler's weapon of choice. The couple's smiles looked more vicious than those long blades, too. Shit, I yelled. Keep going, Amy demanded. Amy's grip tightened on my arm, cutting off whatever blood flow. The cold hadn't zapped from me yet. As we passed apartment A, I stole a look at the windows. Through the cold air erupting from my lips, I saw a similarly horrific scene like the one I saw in apartment B. A middle-aged white couple spread out on the living room floor, presumably the landlords, the Barrymores, naked and laughing. They splashed around on the carpet, a carpet drenched in buckets of blood, as if the couple were making grisly snow angels. Like a persistent cab driver, Amy wouldn't let me stop for too long, not that I wanted to. Not when I could hear the lesbian couple get closer and closer, or when Mr. Barrymore's wild gaze made direct eye contact with my frightened eyes. Finally, we reached the Toyota. Amy shoved me toward the passenger seat. I felt the cold window hit my hands. Honestly, I was shocked my hands didn't explode like busted ice upon impact. Amy hopped in behind the wheel. Get in, she yelled. Terrified, I turned. All of Sunnyside was descending upon us. I saw crazed couples running down the metal stairway. 
Their loud, clanging footsteps sounded like a robotic army. Their frenetic movement made the staircase tremble in the wind. All of them were armed with fillet knives. All of them glowered right at us. And now the lesbian couple and the Barrymores were less than 15 feet away. The Barrymores still nude and bathed in blood, their fillet knives craving our flesh. I heard the Toyota start like a motorcycle, ready to race. And I was ready to get the hell out of there. The smartest thing I'd done all day, or in my entire life, was give Amy those car keys before heading into apartment B. Thank God I did. Without further ado, I jumped into the passenger seat. All I could do was stare out the window as Amy put the car in reverse. The Sunnyside tenants got closer and closer, as did their glares, their bloodlust, their sharp blades. Breathing heavy, Amy drove off with a furious mash on the pedal, and she never looked back. I suppose I shouldn't have either, but I couldn't help myself. Like a trembling child, my wide eyes looked back at Sunnyside, at all the bizarre residents. They gave chase down the street, and then finally they dropped out of sight. We were finally out of their collective crosshairs. Amy and I were safe. By this point, we had no interest in going to Jack Bates' house. Amy didn't even have to talk me into it. She even offered to still go there just for me, just for my Christmas present. But I'd had enough of the book for the holidays. Maybe in January. I'd feel up to exploring more. Just damn sure not now. We made one stop at the local gas station. There, Amy called the Stanwick police and told them about Sunnyside. She begged them to go out there as soon as possible. On the phone, they tried to calm her down, but Amy was understandably not having any of that. They even tried to tell us Sunnyside had been abandoned since the early 90s, just like my research had led me to believe. But nonetheless, the dispatcher told us they'd send a few officers over there to check it out. Only Amy and I weren't sticking around to hear more. In no way. Before leaving Stanwick, I ran inside the convenience store and got Mama her souvenir, a cute bearcat coffee mug. Yeah, yeah, I know. Pretty cheesy mascot for such a dominant high school football team. I gotta say it was unique, though. Plus, Mama did love her animals. Amy and I made it a straight shot back to Atlanta with Christmas music rather than true crime podcasts playing all the way, like we were a family looking at lights on December 24th. Smiling, we sang along to all the cheesy lyrics. I guess narrowly surviving attack from a band of murderers could make you a little sentimental. But through it all, Amy and I survived, and we'd be home for Christmas. When I pulled the van up to the curb in front of Trinity House, my first thought was something along the lines of, Oh, really? I must have the wrong address. My second thought was, I don't want to go in there. Closely followed by, This is a bad place. I'd always assumed that a group home for psychiatric patients would be a little more modern and, well official looking, but this place was straight from the cover art of a gothic horror novel. It was a brooding old relic from the Victorian era, several thousand square feet of curling shingles, crumbling brick, and decaying stone foundation. From what I could see at just a casual glance, Trinity House would probably need tens of thousands of dollars in renovations to pass an inspection. I could scarcely believe that they'd managed to avoid having the building outright condemned by the safety coat inspector. The woman who answered the door looked to be somewhere in her late twenties. She was short, chubby, almost frothing with false enthusiasm. Her smile was a beam of wholesome sunshine, but her eyes were cloudy and distant. She looked like the sort of person who practices smiling in the mirror. She glanced at the Sal's electric logo on my jacket and chirped. You must be the electrician. You're so early. <laughs> no, no, no. That's okay. Come on in. The front entrance opened into a mudroom that was lined on both sides by an eclectic array of ratty-looking coats. 
each of them dangling from an identical plastic hook. The baseboard was boarded by a straggling line of Walmart brand footwear. The mudroom stank like mothballs and feet. So, my name's Marla. I'm the personal support worker on the day shift. Anything you need, just ask. Marla extended her freckled little paw in the same manner a queen might proffer her hand to be kissed by a visiting dignitary. With her dimpled knuckles facing the ceiling and her fingers limply curled towards her palm, I shook it awkwardly and said, My name's Brent. I'm pleased to meet you. She beckoned me to follow and took off at a brisk pace in her white New Balance sneakers. I staggered after her. My toolboxes bouncing off each leg in a painful rhythm as I struggled to keep up. I was led down a short hallway that opened into a sparsely furnished living room, a cavernous space with a vaulted ceiling and dingy wallpaper. Despite the fact that one wall was dominated by two enormous picture windows, the room was somehow still dim and thick with shadows. A small group of residents were gathered in front of an old flat-screen TV, all of them sitting on folding chairs that had been arranged in two razor-straight lines. Some of them looked over at us with startled expressions as we bustled past, alarmed by the outsider who had suddenly burst into their midst. Marla pushed through a swinging door at the far end of the room and I found myself standing in a sad little kitchen. The linoleum was spiderwebbed with chips and cracks and the appliances had all seen their best days back when people were still dancing the Macarena. Breakfast was laid out on some mismatched serving trays, eleven plastic bowls filled with lumpy oatmeal. Each bowl was accompanied by a slice of burnt toast and a styrofoam cup of instant coffee. It looked awful. This way! Watch your step coming down. I was led through another door and down a steep flight of creaky wooden stairs. The concrete floor was damp at the bottom. I dropped my toolboxes with little grunts of relief and wrinkled my nose. It stank overpoweringly of mildew and wet cardboard boxes. I took out my flashlight and had a look at the exposed floor joists overhead. I could barely make out the old wiring and ceramic knobs through the multiple layers of cobwebs. I felt a shiver run down my spine. I hate spiders. I fucking loathe spiders. Marla clapped her hands together with a moist little splut and said, I should get this out of the way right now, I guess. Most of our residents are harmless, but Mr. Reinhardt has a different story. Fortunately for the rest of us, Douglas doesn't leave his room very often. He spends most of his time staring at the bird feeder outside his window. If at all possible, I'd advise that you avoid him. I see. Oh, thanks for the heads up. I waited for Marla to leave. She leaned up against a support pillar and stayed right where she was, staring at me without blinking. Her smile was gone. Just to clarify what I'm saying, Mr. Reinhardt isn't physically dangerous not anymore it's more well it's more the things he says he's very intuitive and he uses this to say the most horrible things he suffers from some very strange delusions she lowered her voice to a husky stage whisper and added mr reinhardt's health is frail his time is coming to an end to be quite frank, it will be a relief to us all. He's an awful man. I pointedly cleared my throat and interjected. You know, I, I should really get started here. Marla emphatically shook her head no at my dismissal and leaned closer. The intensity behind her gaze was unnerving. He's an awful man, she repeated. And he says awful things. Don't respond to him. If you have to go into his room, just announce yourself, get it done, and get out of there. 
I didn't know what to say to this, so I offered her a little shrug and sighed. Lady, I'm an electrician, not a therapist. I'm not getting paid to have conversations with people. Don't worry about it. Marla nodded her approval and finally retreated upstairs to serve her cold breakfast. When she was gone, the first order of business was to destroy the nasty shroud of multi-layered spider webs that was hanging mere inches above the top of my head. I brushed them away with an old corn broom I found leaning in a corner, grimacing and trying not to screech every time a live spider performed a kamikaze dive and sprinted across the floor. I shone my flashlight around and grumbled to myself. As I'd expected, some long-ago home improvement enthusiast had left a confusing clusterfuck in their wake. It looked like most of the old knob and tube was still there, running almost cheek to gel alongside the newer wiring. It was a mess. Nothing ever easy, I told the corn broom. The trailing tangles of spider silk that were caught at the edge of the bristles made the broom look a bit like an unkempt old man. And I had to smile a little. Your name is Douglas, I announced, in honor of the boogeyman that lives upstairs. Once it had a name, the broom became unsettlingly anthropomorphic in the gloom. A wizened old face, glaring at me from beneath a cloud of silvery hair. I leaned it against the wall and wiped my hands on my pants. He's an awful man, I thought. And suddenly, Douglas the corn broom didn't seem funny anymore. I hid it behind the furnace where it wouldn't be able to see me, and I got to work. Trinity House seemed to ooze a kind of sour, mildewed energy that matched the smell of the peeling wallpaper. I couldn't imagine struggling against the grim specter of mental illness in such a dreary place. A surreal environment of dim lighting long shadows, and oppressive silence. I went out of there as soon as possible. I kicked into high gear and moved along at a brisk pace, and it wasn't long before there was only one outlet left to replace. However, as my shit luck would have it, the outlet was located in the proverbial lion's den, Mr. Reinhardt's room. Just a few more minutes worth of work, I thought and then I'd be zooming back to the shop with the radio blasting and fresh air ripping through the windows. How bad could it be? I took a peek through Mr. Reinhardt's open door before knocking, hoping to get a sense of the man before I had to actually deal with him. There was a neatly made single bed tucked into a corner, bookended by a mismatching dresser and nightstand. A small table and chair set was stuffed into the opposite corner. There was a cactus plant at the table, the room smelled strongly of carpet shampoo, and beneath that, the sour tang of old piss. A thin cloud of wispy, silvery hair was poking into view from behind the back of a plush rocking chair, a big box store cheapie that had been positioned to face the room's only window. There was a heart-stopping instant where I actually believed that it was Douglas the corn broom propped up in the chair and I almost bolted before I realized the owner of the diaphanous hair cloud was faintly grumbling to himself. I hovered in the doorway and listened for a while, granting the old man a silent audience for his rambling stream of consciousness diatribe against all that lay beyond the walls of his room. I had a feeling that this was his favorite pastime. When I felt that I probably heard enough of his verbal attack on humanity at large, I politely coughed and rapped on the doorframe. I announced my presence in a loud, clear voice, carefully enunciating my words as I spoke. Hello, Mr. Reinhardt. Hello? My name's Brent. I just need to pop in for a few minutes and replace the old tandem outlet in the corner. The grumbling abruptly ceased, but the cloud of hair didn't stir or move in the slightest. The image of a cobweb-encrusted broom popped back into my mind, unwelcome and unbidden. It was Douglas the Broom after all, laying rigidly against the chair and gazing blindly out the window while it waited for its special guest to arrive. It would be smiling its vapid corn broom smile at nothing and no one and nowhere at all, just smiling away 
and lurking with a predator's steady patience, waiting for me to come on in and close the door behind me. Of course, that was completely ridiculous, wasn't it? I let ten seconds tick by before I knocked a second time and started to repeat my introduction. I was interrupted by a hoarse, papery voice that hissed. I heard you the first time, you goddamned idiot. I'm not deaf. Get in here. Do what you gotta do. I felt my cheeks flush red. I mumbled a sheepish apology and got to work. Mr. Reinhardt didn't bother to respond. The only sounds in the room were the labored gurgle of his breathing, the skittering rustle of wire being pulled, and the occasional whirr from my driver. The silence was thick with unspoken malice. I'd never felt so profoundly uncomfortable in my entire life. I was just about to install the faceplate and get the hell out of there when Mr. Reinhardt's angry, rasping hiss unexpectedly drilled into my ears again, making me flinch and drop a screw. I saw what you did. I paused and turned his words over in my mind, puzzling over their meaning. I had no idea what he was talking about. Speaking slowly and carefully, I said, I'm sorry, but I'm not sure what you mean by that. I saw what you were up to in the office, shithead. I gaped uncomprehendingly at the back of his chair. I had a sinking feeling that things were about to get unpleasant. What are you talking about? I saw you go in the office and rummage through the medication cart. Stealing pills is my guess. All these pill junkies running around these days, it's a goddamn disgrace. My heart started beating a little faster in my chest, and I felt my mouth go dry. I dragged my tongue over my lips and said, I didn't do that. I didn't even go in there. I know that. <coughs> <coughs> Mr. Reinhardt barked, and he choked out a ragged fit of coughing. When it passed, he wheezed. <laughs> it won't matter. I'll call the cops and tell them you did it. We got a phone downstairs we can use. I was speechless. I picked up the fallen screw and installed the wall plate with hands that weren't quite steady. The old bastard couldn't possibly be serious. Why would he do such a thing? You got nothing to say for yourself? What do you want? Are you trying to blackmail me? What is this? I could feel panic mounting in my chest. The old man wasn't joking. He was dead fucking serious. No, nothing like that. I just want you to grab a chair and come sit down for a spell. A pale, wispy hand popped into view. It had motioned at the table set in the corner. Put one of them chairs over here and have a seat. I snorted in disbelief and started gathering my tools. Actually sit around and visit with this fucking guy? Hell no. I said, Yeah, I don't think so, old man. I'm gonna leave now. You'll do it, but the cops come pounding on your door with a warrant. Mr. Reinhardt corrected me. He sounded like he was smiling. Stealing medications from the mentally disabled. That's pretty low, bud. You'll be lucky if you don't take a tumble down some stairs when they haul you in for booking. I snapped. Yeah, except I didn't do that. They won't find your pills because I don't fucking have them. Mr. Reinhardt chuckled at my panic and said... Oh, we already talked about that, son. I know you don't got those pills. Because it was me what took them. You do what I tell you to do, and I'll put them back. I couldn't believe my ears. I sputtered. And if I just walk out of here, you'll still put them back? I didn't do anything wrong here, and I... It don't matter, he interjected. You got a history, bud? I know you do. They'll get a search warrant and they'll find enough pills in your house to put you away for a decade. I froze just as still as a statue and stared at the back of his chair. I licked my dry lips and whispered, What did you say? You bet your ass the cops will seize that cargo van while they're at it. They'll completely strip the interior, 
Slash open the seats and tear out the headliner, the dashboard. They'll tear out every goddamn thing. What do you think your boss is going to say about that? I stayed silent, but I knew exactly what Sal would say if the police came bursting into his office to demand the keys. You're fired. That's what he'd say. He'd squint up at me from the business side of that big cluttered desk and he'd say, I gave you a chance and you fucking blew it. Get the fuck out of my shop, you're fired. Out of a job and back in the clink, the old man crooned. By Jesus, what a mess. If only there was some way out. How do you know about any of that? I demanded, and my voice cracked. How did you know anything about me at all? The old man ignored me and continued to wax poetic on the subject of my ruination. The neighbors, he said. All the neighbors will come out to watch them frog march you into the back of a cruiser. They'll talk about it for years. The court of public opinion and all that. No one will remember if you were guilty or innocent. But they'll always remember seeing you in handcuffs. What is it that you want? What's the purpose of this? Mr. Reinhardt made an impatient sound at the back of his throat and muttered, I told you already. Grab a chair and sit down. I want to tell you something. My nemesis paused to endure another violent spasm of death rattle hacking and wheezing. It was painful to hear. I could only imagine how it felt. When it was over, he spat a wad of black-tinted goop into a small garbage can beside his chair. Fuck! He gasped. Dirty fucking cocksucker, does that ever hurt? I thought, okay, it's time to walk out of here. But I didn't do that. Instead, I grabbed myself a chair and carried it over to the window. There wasn't any other choice. Douglas Reinhardt wasn't long for the world. I could see that he'd been a big man back in his prime, but terminal illness had whittled him down into a cadaverous shadow. He was wearing an old work shirt that looked like a faded green tarp on his skeletal frame. It was sloppily tucked into a pair of khaki pants that were big enough for three of him. The old man's face was a hollow-eyed death mask beneath the thin whirl of his hair. A mummified bobblehead that wobbled unsteadily atop a crooked twig of a neck. He snapped, What the fuck are you staring at, jackass? and reached for a can of non-alcoholic beer that was sweating away on a car table beside him, wincing at the effort. He was clutching a portable oxygen cylinder in his other hand, cradling it protectively against his bony chest as if it were a sleeping infant. Put the fucking chair down and sit your ass on top of it. Stay a while. Once again, I bit my tongue and did as I was told. Mr. Reiner took a careful swig from his near beer and assessed me with sunken bloodshot eyes. He looked exactly as he'd sounded, like an elderly rattlesnake in a permanently foul mood. Mr. Reiner may have been dying, but his blunted old fangs were still dripping venom. He grunted. What's your name again, kid? Didn't catch it. Wasn't paying attention. My name's Brent, I said, and I threw in a sarcastic pleased to meet you. The old man skinned back his shoestring lips in a gap-toothed smile. He said, Fuck you and your belly-aching Brent. You got lots of time. You got all afternoon. You got your entire fucking life. Not me. My life got taken away from me. He took another sip of his watery placebo and put it back on the table. His emaciated stick arm was trembling slightly from the strain of holding the can. You've been doing electric for very long, kid? A few years. Started my apprenticeship after I... I stopped myself right there. I was about to say, after I got out. The old man twitched the corners of his mouth in a knowing smirk. Me? I was a contractor and general handyman. Had my own business. Built fences and sun decks and 
the occasional roofing job. Life was pretty good. We weren't rich, but my wife never had to work. I wouldn't allow it. A woman's place is in the home. Mr. Reinert saw the look on my face and waved it off, an arrogant, dismissive gesture that pretty much said everything I needed to know about him. I never raised a hand to her, not once in nine years. I wasn't an abusive man, never was. She minded herself and the kids, I kept us afloat, and life was pretty good. But in the summer of 79, it all went to shit. He trailed off, staring morosely at his broomstick legs while his breath whistled in and out of his nose. I shifted around in my chair and waited. It started out with a robbery, he said. Someone broke into my shed when we were going into town. A bunch of my tools got stolen. They got my table saw and my good socket set, too. I had to spend most of my savings to replace it all. It wasn't insured. The cops barely even gave a shit when I made the report. They just shrugged and told me that it happens all the time. Next, it was the truck. The body was rotting out in a few spots and one of the front bearings was starting to go, but I was planning to take care of all that later in the summer. But then the son of a bitch started leaking oil all over the place, and I knew I was probably up shit creek. I got under there and seen that just about all the seals decided to crap out at the same time, and the oil pan too. I could hardly believe it. The truck just wasn't worth the trouble no more, so I scrapped the old girl and picked up a used van at a dealership. They fucked me on the financing, but I didn't have any money to put down, and I was fucked without it. Mr. Reinhardt's eyes went muddy with anger. The memory of this outrage still burned hot and fresh in his laboring old heart. It wasn't long after that when I started seeing things out of the corner of my eye, he said, and the bloodless slash of his mouth tucked itself into a sour crescent. At first, it would only happen after dark. I'd see them when I was focused on something in front of me. You know, reading the paper or watching the tube, something like that. They'd scurry across my peripheral vision. Just a quick glimpse from the corner of my eye. I'd whip my head around real quick to try and catch a better look at them, but there wouldn't be nothing there. The old man glared at me, clearly expecting some kind of response. I didn't know what he wanted me to say, so I asked, oh, What did these things look like? I mean, as far as you could tell. He considered my question with a grave expression, struggling to find an adequate comparison that I would be able to understand. He said, Well, they didn't buzz around like a fly or a skeeter. Nothing like that. They would actually run around in thin air darting past my head on all these fast little legs like a... like a spider, I guess. Well, they didn't look like spiders. Not exactly, but it's close enough. An instant chill pricked up the hair on the back of my neck. Mr. Reinert nodded and smirked a little at my discomfort. This went on for a couple of weeks before I couldn't take it no more, he said. I went to see an eye doctor. He told me it was a retinal detachment. Just a few tiny little tears way back inside each eye. He said it wasn't nothing serious. I was just seeing shadows from the tears. He said there wasn't nothing he could... He... Oh, sweet Jesus! <laughs> <laughs> When it was over, the old man spat a fat, murky glob into his trash can, and he wiped the tears from his eyes with a bitter and resentful kind of shame. It was hot that summer, he wheezed. Hottest one in years. In those days, air conditioners weren't cheap. You'd open all the windows and put on the fans, but it was stinking hot in that house. You know? Just ignorant in there. 
It made you half crazy. The sweat always rolling down your face and your shirt sticking to your back. Flo kept bugging me to cough up for a couple window shakers. Said the heat was driving her nuts. It wasn't in the budget. We couldn't afford it. But she didn't want to believe that. I said, well, maybe you should have walked her through the finances then. Sat her down and had a discussion. A discussion, the old man repeated, and he shook his head in mock wonderment. You haven't never been married yet. When a woman decides that she wants something, her ears stop working. There isn't going to be a discussion. No. I just try to do the Christian thing and suffer them in silence. Flo, the spiders, the kids always hollering at each other, all of it! But it was impossible. His hands clenched into skeletal fists. He shook one in the air and said, There I'd be, trying to watch the television, with Flo bitching in my ear and sweat dripping into the crack of my ass, and I'd see him. Out of the corner of my eye, I'd see them running around, scurrying over top each other, so many of them. More and more every night. And would Flo ever shut the fuck up? <sighs> would she ever? Good Christ, it was constant! Just blah, 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 this, and why can't we have that? And then the kids would start yapping at me, too, and that really got my goat. I knew they were just following after their mother, but I'd be damned if I didn't want to slap the taste out of their mouths. I fidgeted at the edge of my chair and looked longingly at the door. Mr. Reinhardt saw this and snorted. Don't look over there. Look at me. I'm talking to you. I forced myself to scoot back in my seat. I'm listening, I said. I don't have much choice, do I? The old man fixed me with a baleful stare and continued on like he'd never been interrupted. I tell him, stop your whining. I didn't have no air conditioning when I was your age. We didn't even have a goddamn indoor toilet. So just think about that. That would shut them up for a while, but flow. Oh, she never shut up. If it wasn't an air conditioner, it was something else. She wanted a bigger TV. She wanted a dishwasher. She wanted to go shopping for some new clothes. And how the fuck was that supposed to help? How was that supposed to put money in the bank? Mr. Reinhardt paused to wet his whistle. He studied the can, turning it relentlessly in his hands. Things were looking bad, he said. I spent the last of our savings on a down payment for that horse shit deal of a van. It got to the point where I was thinking I'd have to remortgage the house. But then I landed a contract to put up about 600 feet of privacy fence for a fella named Elton Hyde. And it was a godsend. Now everyone knew Elton Hyde was a grade A died in the wool son of a bitch. He was an upper management down at the paper mill, and he liked to throw his weight around town. The man was an asshole, but I needed the work. So there I was, digging holes for the fence posts out in this bastard's front yard, and sweet Jesus, was I ever sweating under that sun. It had to be 90 degrees out there by 9 o'clock. I was soaked right through, boots and all. Elk comes waddling out of his house, and I see that he's scowling away while he's inspecting my work. I come over and ask if everything's okay, but he barks at me. Hell no! You got these holes veering off at an angle. Can't you see that? Mr. Reinhardt stared out the window, brooding darkly over the memory of this insult. Slowly, he said, No, I'd come out there the day before and measured it all out twice, and I made damn sure that the stakes marking the post holes all lined up straight as narrow. But he was right. The goddamn holes I dug were staggered on an angle. I didn't know what to say. I told him that I'd fix it, 
and all out crowds in right close to me in huffs. You're damn right you'll fix it, or you'll pay someone else to do it out of your own pocket. I don't give a rat's ass which one it is. Just get it done. I watched the beefy bastard stomp back up to his house and slam the door. All I could think was, I bet you got central air in there. And suddenly I realized that I can see them out of the corner of my eye. The spiders. Right in broad daylight, there they were, running round to the air on either side of my head. Dozens, maybe even hundreds of them. I'd never seen so many before. It scared me. I started walking to the van and they followed me, just like a cloud of horse flies chasing after some poor old nag in a pen. I jumped in the van and they came right in after me, swarming around my head in a cloud, and I lost my mind. I started swatting at them, hollering, get away from me, leave me the fuck alone. <coughs> Mr. Reinhardt paused to hack up another payload of mucus plugs and spat them in the garbage in rapid succession. Puh, puh, puh. The sound they made when they hit the bottom of the can made me feel faintly nauseous. Right then, just as I'm losing my goddamn mind and swinging at the air, a rusted out old crown Vic comes roaring by at 20 over the limit. It's some long-haired kid with the stereo blaring at top volume. I was too busy fighting all the fucking spiders to hear him coming, so it kind of gave me a start when the kid comes slamming past with his music so loud. When I turned to look at him, one of those nasty cocksuckers jumped on my face and ran right into my ear. I made a strangled little sound in my throat, and I resisted the urge to reach up and take a swipe at the side of my head. The rational part of my mind knew that Mr. Reinert's spiders were just a delusion, but the part that was ruled by primal fear didn't give a fuck about any of that. Spiders. It gibbered. Fucking spiders running into your fucking ear. Jesus Christ almighty. What a horror show. I cut my own head off. I'd fucking jump into a bonfire. Holy shit, it moved so fast, he murmured, and he delicately touched the hollow where his jawline met his earlobe. It was just a split second in zoom. There it goes, right into my ear. I felt an itch way down in there for a second, and then I smelled something in the air, like a mix of burning toast and ozone and then it hits me all at once hits me like a slap in the face it was as if a fog had lifted and i could finally see the old man ruefully shook his head as if he was still amazed by how blind he'd been to something that had been so glaringly obvious it was him he snarled it was that pimple-faced son of a bitch in the Crown Vic who fucked up my post holes. How long was he watching me? How long was he waiting for his chance to sabotage my work? And then he comes driving by to gloat at me, to laugh at me, while I sat there and lost my fucking mind. I knew it was him. I knew it, like I know my own name. I fired up the van and chased after the little bastard, caught up to him at a four-way stop and swerved around him to block the intersection. I run up to his window and the kid looks scared, like he already knows that he's done for. He pokes his head out his window and yells, Hey, what the fuck is your problem, man? like he didn't know what he'd done to me. Hey, maybe he didn't, I ventured. I mean, maybe. Mr. Reinert stuck his chin out and spat. Bullshit. He knew. I didn't even have to say anything. I just ran up and hammered him as hard as I could in the nose. I felt it explode under my fist. 
His head flopped back on his skinny little neck, and I grabbed a fistful of that long, greasy hair. He was slapping at my arm and squealing, Somebody help me, in his real high, girlish voice. And somehow that pissed me off even more. I started pounding his face in with my free hand, just driving it in there, hard as I could. The kid went limp after the second punch, but I didn't stop. I couldn't stop. His blood was on my shirt, and I still couldn't stop. It wouldn't. The old man trailed off, but I knew what he was going to say. He was about to say, it wouldn't let me. Did you kill him? Is that why you're here? Well, not at the time. Although I was aiming to. He smiled. I wish I had. I felt a chill skitter up my spine at his matter-of-fact tone, completely nonchalant. As if beating someone to death with your bare hands is just something that happens every now and then. I'd known some real psychos during my stint in jail, and the frail old man sitting before me was as dangerously unbalanced as the worst of them. Some old biddy stuck her head out of the front door and started yelling that she was going to call the cops. I fed the kid one last haymaker and told her, You better get the fuck back in that house, you nosy old bitch! The old bat took a good look at me and seen that I meant business. Her eyes got real big behind her glasses, and she popped back through the door like a prairie dog. I'll bet she never moved so fast before in her life. <laughs> the kid was still kind of just dangling halfway out his window. I ripped off his side mirror and bounced the fucking thing off the back of his skull. I told him, get out of town, cocksucker. Don't let me see you again. He just groaned and kept bleeding. I was five minutes down the road before I passed a couple cruisers ripping the other way with their cherries on. I pulled over to let them pass, just like a good citizen. He paused to take another breather and I realized that, despite the fact that the old bastard made my skin crawl, I was becoming morbidly captivated by his story. Listening to him was like watching an 18-wheeler slowly drift over the double yellow and into oncoming traffic. I knew that the outcome was going to be disastrous, but I could not look away. Where did you go from there? I asked, and the mad joy at beating the shit out of his long-ago rival faded from his eyes. Home, he said. I figured the cops would be looking for my van, but they wouldn't be looking very hard. Not over some dope fiend with hair halfway down his back. The best thing to do was head home and wait for morning. I never thought there'd be a reason to look over my shoulder in my own goddamn house. I was wrong. Mr. Reinert looked stricken. He fiddled with his oxygen tank with trembling hands. Flo didn't even look up from the tube when I shuffled to the front door. He wheezed. She stared at the screen and said, You're early. I mumbled something about it being too hot out there and made a beeline for the laundry room. I scrubbed most of the blood out of my shirt in the laundry sink and tossed it in the washer. There was a real bad stink coming off me. A stench like burning wires. And my head was aching something awful. My hands were swelling up too, and it hurt like a bastard. All I wanted was a beer and a shower. Everything else could wait a goddamn minute. I started for the bathroom, and something on the floor caught my eye. It was just barely poking out from underneath the dryer. I fished it out, and saw that it was a receipt for a box of decon. I thought to myself, well shit, we got some rats and I'd drop back on the floor. I didn't want to think about anything except a cold beer. I drank one standard in front of the open fridge, and then I drank another one. 
took a long, cold shower, and lay down in our bed with a fan pointed at my face to keep the sweat from pooling in my ears. I was just about to doze off when I realized that Flo never said anything about us having a rat problem. Never even mentioned it. Mr. Reinert shook his head and stabbed the air between us with an accusatory finger. Flo was always a good wife to me before that stinking hot summer came along. He croaked. Always was. But let me tell you something. That woman hadn't done nothing but complain for weeks on end. She'd bitch about every damn thing you could imagine. She complained so much you'd think it was a fucking job. But she never even made a peep about a rat infestation. It wasn't right. I knew that it wasn't right. I figured I'd worried about it later and tried to relax. But I couldn't sleep. Every time I closed my eyes, it was like a slideshow. I'd see the receipt for the decon, then the hippie with his face all busted up. Then I'd see that receipt again. Flo kept popping up, and Elton too. I couldn't tell if they were laughing or screaming. I think they were doing both. The look in his eyes made my skin crawl. They were crackling with old, smoldering rage. A fury that would not and could not be abated. Not ever. Mr. Reinhardt could live to be 10,000 years old and that fever would still be boiling away in the black cauldron of his heart. Douglas Reinhardt may or may not have been suffering from a break from reality. But there was no doubt that his soul was twisted beyond redemption. He was really and truly damned. The corner of the old man's mouth curled into a sneer, as if he could read my thoughts. He held up his can in a sarcastic salute and said, You think you know, don't you? You don't know shit, cocksucker. None of you know shit. You all flutter through life on your tippy toes, all smiles, and who gives a goddamn while you fiddle fuck your way around town and what? What do you know? Trusting as a child, all of you, and you don't know shit fuck at all. Mr. Reiner tapped the side of his skull and grinned a humorless grin. But I know, he gasped. I know the darkness, Brent. You better believe it. He slumped back into his chair, his face slowly tinging a light shade of purple as he struggled to catch his breath. In the silence, I finally admitted to myself that I was afraid of him. He was an awful man, and he was prone to saying awful things, but it was far more than that. Douglas Reinhardt was tainted. I could almost smell his decaying humanity beneath the stringent bite of the antiseptic they had used to clean up his incontinent piss puddles. He scared me very badly. And how, exactly, did Mr. Reinhardt know about the legal troubles in my past? How did he know I was still doing the thing that got me locked up in the first place? He didn't even know my fucking name, so how? The old man grimaced at the pain in his chest and struggled to sit up straight in his chair. I had another beer for supper that night, he said. I watched the 11 o'clock news to see if they'd mentioned anything about... Hmm. <laughs> you know, what happened. But they didn't say nothing about it. Flo came and stood in the doorway for a while with her arms crossed. I could feel her looking at me but I pretended like I didn't notice. She stood there and watched me for a good long while before she made a big show of clearing her throat to get my attention. I thought she'd ask me if I wasn't feeling so good or something like that, but no. Nope. All she said was, you sleeping out here tonight? I says, yep, I think so. And I'll be goddamned if she didn't look relieved. My own wife didn't want me in the bed with her no more. 
Nine years of marriage, two kids, a life I'd carved out for us with my own hands. It was over. And why? Why? That lost, bewildered expression flitted across his features once again. There and gone. In a split second. And then BOOM! All at once the spiders are back! And they weren't just crawling around beside my head this time. Hell no! They're all over the fucking walls, the ceiling, every goddamn place. Thousands of them! The whole fucking room was swarming with the bastards, and I could hear them. I could actually hear the sound of all their little feet pitter pattering against nothing at all. At the same time, that itch came back, something fierce, just burning away in the back of my brain, so fucking hot that my eyes started watering. Flo sees the look on my face and asks, Are you okay? And it was all casual, you know? Like there wasn't any reason to be freaking out, because there weren't six thousand invisible bugs running through the air and one scratching around inside my brain like it wasn't hot enough in there to fry an egg on the fucking coffee table! <coughs> <coughs> Mr. Reinert shook his head in grave disappointment. Well, when she said that, hell, I don't know. I didn't even think about it. I just popped right up like a jack-in-the-box and belted her in the mouth. I watched in silence as he took a quivering breath from his oxygen tank. He chased the canned air with a slurp from his near beer and spat into the garbage can. She fell straight back and her head bounced off the doorframe. The old man wheezed. I grabbed her up by the front of her nightgown before she could fall, and I shook her like a rag doll. It ripped at the seams, and she started to cry. I could see blood on her teeth, and God help me. I was glad that I'd made her bleed. I was glad. Because I... Mr. Reinert's words faltered in the dry, withered flap of his tongue. He blinked back a shimmer of tears, and for just a brief instant, I could see the human being trapped inside the rotting cage of the monster he'd become. A man that was once a child who'd played at his mother's feet. A man who tried to live his life and love his own to the best of his narrow ability. Because you knew, I said, and he nodded. The sorrow in his eyes was almost painful to see. Almost. Because, even though Mr. Reinert was likely a very sick man, he was also a very bad man. An awful man. And in the summer of 79, he had done... Awful things. She was against me, the old man croaked. He was talking at his hands, which were clenched together between his bulbous knees and a tight, bony knot. It was plain as day that my own wife hated my guts. And she always had. She was biding her time all those years, just playing her part and pretending to be a good wife to me. I didn't want to believe it, but I knew that it was true. I hauled her in close, almost nose to nose, and I told her, You don't fool me no more. Do you understand? You don't fool me. Go clean yourself up and don't you dare wake those kids, don't you fucking dare! You're a charming fella, aren't you? I muttered. A spark flickered in the old man's eyes, and he leaned forward in his chair. Almost by reflex, I cowered away from the possibility of his touch. I didn't want him to touch me. He was unclean. It's because I lived such a charming life, Mr. Reinert snarled. 
How's about you shut the fuck up and let me talk? How's that sound? I tried to look him directly in the eye in a meek show of defiance, but I failed. Mr. Reinert shook a warning finger and said, You're gonna sit right there and goddamn well listen to every last word I got to say. I spent almost 40 years of my life bouncing back and forth in the street to the hospital. And in all that time, there hasn't been one single soul that ever sat down and actually listened to what I got to say. Not once. So you shut your mouth and you listen, or I swear to Christ you'll be eating breakfast in the tank tomorrow morning. Listen, but not judge, I said to my boots. Right. Come on, you can't. I can, he rasped. Don't you dare judge me, you ignorant son of a bitch. Were you there? No! You snot-nosed punk! You don't know jack all about nothing! I held up my hands in surrender and said, Okay, I'm done. Continue. What happened after you hit your wife? Mr. Reinert stared a couple of smoldering holes through my head and grunted. I let her go and she ran off to cry in the bathroom. Wouldn't you know it? As soon as the door shut behind her, the spiders were gone. Poof. Just disappeared in the blink of an eye. That horrible fucking itch was gone too. All at once. I wasn't mad anymore. I just felt drunk and tired and scared. My hand hurt like a dirty bastard. My mind was spinning off to every direction at once. There was something going on. Some bigger scheme that I couldn't quite understand. I didn't see the whole picture yet. But I knew it was getting close. I drank another beer and popped one more while I sat there and stared at the wall. I don't remember falling asleep, but I woke up to snow on the TV screen. The sky just starting to get lighter in the east. My first thought when I opened my eyes was... I need to take a drive right over to Elton's place right away. I popped some aspirin and snuck into the kitchen to grab my bottle of Johnny Walker before I left. I nipped away at it while I drove into town. I drove past his house and seen there were lights on inside. I parked just around the corner, where he wouldn't be able to see the van from his front window. It wasn't long before a car backed out of his garage and he could have knocked me over with a feather because it wasn't Elton's white Cadillac that pulled out of there. It was the hippie in his Crown Vic. Mr. Reiner drained the last dregs of his non-alcoholic beer and stared morosely at the empty can. He went past me and I followed him with my headlights off. The kid drove to an all-night gas station at the edge of town. I waited a little ways down the road while he filled up his tank. When I seen him go inside to pay, I rolled up in the van and waited for him to come out. The little bastard didn't know I was there until I popped on the headlights. He froze like a rabbit for a second. Then he took off running for his car. I threw it in gear and squealed after him. When he seen he wasn't going to make it to the car, he tried to scamper back to the gas station. I hit the ground running and tackled him head first into one of the pumps. Mr. Reinert slapped his hands together to mimic the sound it made when the young man's head cracked into the pump. It made me wince, but he flexed his hands and smiled his way through the pain. Mr. Reinert was clearly enjoying this part of his narrative. It was his favorite part of the story. I dragged him back to the van by the scruff of his neck. The kid was only half conscious, just sort of waving his arms around in the air and moaning, Don't do it, man. Please don't. His face was completely fucked from the beating I'd laid on him the day before. He looked like someone painted him five shades of purple, all swollen and cut up. Just a complete fucking mess. He started making some noise when I tossed him in the van, so I squeezed his air off with both hands and told him to keep his mouth shut. I tied him up with a couple of extension cords and shut the door on his crying. The clerk was peering at me through the window, so I pulled my hat down low and peeled out of there. I headed north and drove up the old gravel pit. 
The pit was abandoned back in the 60s, and it was just a giant scummy old pond by this point. Most of it was rainwater and fertilizer runoff from the cornfields. It reeked like a shithouse. I dragged Mr. Dipshit over to the edge of that dirty cesspool, and I said, You gotta explain yourself, mister, right now. He said, I didn't do nothing, man. You're fucking crazy. Well, that wasn't the answer I was looking for, so I held his head under the water and counted to ten. I pulled him out and asked him if he was the son of the bitch that stole my tools. He says he's never stolen nothing from nobody, and I laughed at him. I says, well, look, we got a goddamn saint over here. Let's give him another baptism. The kid started crying at me with all the please bullshit, but it didn't do him no good. This time I held him under until I counted to twenty. When I let him up, I asked him again if he stole my tools. He said, I'm sorry, man. I needed the money. And that pissed me right off. I slapped him in the mouth and told him I needed the money too, cocksucker. Now what about the truck? What did you put in the oil? It ate away all the seals. The kid tried to say he didn't know nothing about that, and into the drink he went. I held him under until the bubbles stopped floating to the surface. He coughed and choked and blubbered until he puked in the weeds. I stood over him and waited till he was done. I said, You better talk to me, boy. You tell me everything right fucking now. Or so help me, Jesus, I will drown you like a rat. The kid looks up at me with puke on his chin and squeals. I'll tell you whatever you want to know, just don't do that anymore. I says, That a boy. Tell me who put you up to this. And don't you lie to me. Well, Mr. Reinhardt grinned. It was not no surprise at all when the kid says, Mr. Hyde paid me to do it. He called me into his office and said that a guy could make an easy hundred bucks if they could keep their mouth shut. He gave me an address and he told me to break into your garage and steal your tools. He said, clean him right out. I don't care what you do with the stuff after, just clean him right out. He called me into his office again a couple of weeks later and handed me a plastic bottle. He said he'd give me another hundred if I poured the stuff in your oil. Mr. Reiner turned his grin up to the ceiling, basking in the memory of this validation. He purred. I asked him how much he charged to move all those stakes that were marking the post holes. And the stupid little shit. Jesus Christ, no word of a lie. He actually kind of frowns and starts griping for fuck's sake. He says, only got fifty bucks. It wasn't no fair. That was a lot of work, man. I got a full hundred for the truck and that took like maybe two minutes at the most. Fucking hell! The old man grimaced. He says that and right away that itches back and it's bad. It's eating right through the back of my brain. The spiders were all around us. So many of them, they blocked out the sunrise. And in the dark, I grabbed the hippie by the ears and I twisted. I grabbed those dirty goddamn ears of his and I fucking twisted them like a radio dial. He screamed and I screamed right along with him. Screamed and laughed and screamed some more. <laughs> A kid hollered, I didn't know it was you. I needed the money. I couldn't say no. <laughs> and now you see. Mr. Reinert's voice was taut with emotion. His narrow features were almost writhing in an ecstasy of righteous affirmation. It was all connected. He paid one of his grunts from the mill to do his dirty work. You know why the bastard hired me to put up his fence? To keep me close. That's why. To have complete control over me and my destruction. He wanted to break me in every way possible, and he wanted a front row seat to watch it happen. 
Okay. But why? It was more of a plea than a question. Why would he want that? You better believe I was aiming to find out. But the asshole lying there in the weeds didn't have no more answers for me. I knew what I had to do. I stood up and raised my arms and I opened myself to them. Mr. Reinhardt nodded grimly at my revolted expression. It was bad, he said. They poured into me through my ears and down my throat, up my nose and my ass and down my cockhole. They even pushed through my eyes. Just hundreds and thousands of them streaming into me every which way they could. They burned like fire. The pain was unbearable. When it was finally over, I was just standing there, weeping like a child while the kid stared at me with his eyes bugging out of their sockets. It was a minute or two before I could trust myself to move, he murmured. I felt different. I felt like I was vibrating at a higher frequency. I felt powerful. I smiled down at the kid and he cringed away from me. Because he felt it too. <clears throat> he felt the power coming off me in waves. I went back to the van to scare up an old rag and some twine. I laid the rag out flat at the edge of the water and piled up a bunch of stones in the middle. The kid said, What are you doing, man? Hey, talk to me. I ignored him and tied the four corners of the rag together. It made a bag of stones that weighed about ten pounds. I thought that would probably be enough. I knelt down beside him and patted him on the shoulder. I said, I don't give a fuck if you knew me or not, but maybe you were just doing what your master told you to do, like a good dog, and I can't blame you for that. But you still bit me, son. Now, I gotta put you down. The kid started bawling and screeching for help, trying to roll away and I gave him a good stomp on the kidney. I tied that bag full of rocks around his neck and the twine and told him, have a good look at the sunrise, it's your last one. The kid was crying so hard he gave himself a nosebleed. He tried to give me the song and dance about leaving town, slobbering and bleeding all over himself. And I says, can it ass wipe? I won't see you ever again this way, neither. Mr. Reiner, I breathed. Come on, man. You didn't. The joyous triumph in his eyes made me feel sick. I did, he crowed. I threw the son of a whore into the water. He struggled to the surface, but not for long. I waited until the water was still again before I left, just to be sure. I gazed out the window at the bird feeder and tried to imagine the last few minutes of the victim's life. His terror and confusion. The gleeful madness dancing in his tormentor's eyes. I asked the old man's reflection. Where did you go next? The old man's ghostly twin gave me a crooked smile in the window. I wanted to pay a visit to my old pal Elton Hyde. But I needed to have a word with the missus first. There was a reckoning at hand. There were questions that needed answers. And by Christ, she was going to answer them. Mr. Reinhardt's rattling breath hitched in his chest, and he was doubled over by another coughing fit. When it had run its course, he spat the vileness that had been expelled from his lungs into the wastebasket and croaked, Give me another one of those fake beers, kid. I'm dry. He pointed to a cooler that was tucked beneath the table. I plucked a can of no-name, non-alcoholic swill out of the inch or so of cold water that was slowly warming up at the bottom of the cooler and tried to hand it to him. Mr. Reinert shook his head and grumbled. Pop the tab for me. 
I can't hardly do it no more. I swallowed my distaste for the man and did as he asked. He took a trembling swallow and groaned. It's like dying of thirst when there's water all around you. I can't drink the real stuff anymore. Liver's shot. Lungs are shot. Everything's... running away. I... What happened when you got home? I interrupted. I was caught somewhere between complete disgust for the man and eager impatience to hear his story out to the bitter end. I didn't want to listen to one more word from this elderly degenerate's mouth, but at the same time, I was burning to hear it all. I drank down almost a quarter of the bottle of Johnny Walker by the time I pulled into the driveway, he said. Didn't even feel it. I was humming like a live wire. I felt like I was stretching my own skin, like I was 300 pounds of gunpowder crammed into a matchbox. I slammed through the front door and hollered, Florence, where are you? It's time for a reckoning, woman. Flo was nowhere to be found, but I could smell something cooking in the kitchen. There was a crock pot of stew bubbling away on the counter, and beside it there was a note that said, I fixed you some supper. It might be the last meal you ever get from me. I don't know what got into you last night, but I won't stand for it. I took the kids and went to my mother's house. We won't come back until you fix whatever is wrong with you. Please take care. Mr. Reiner bared his yellowing, picket-fenced teeth in an unconscious snarl. He choked out. I crumpled up a note and threw it in the garbage. Fix what was wrong with me. Fuck's sake. I couldn't hardly believe it. I slammed down the lid and started to walk away. But something made me go take another look in there. The old man rubbed his temples and grimaced. It was in there, way down at the bottom of the can. She tried to cover it up with some plastic bags but the top of the box was just barely peeking out. It was a package of decon, and it was empty. I looked at the box, and then I looked at the crock pot, and I looked at the box again. I knew what she'd done, but I didn't want to believe it. It was just too much. Mr. Reinert blinking away a sudden brightness in his eyes and drank deeply from his fresh can of near beer. Now there was only one way to prove to myself what I already knew to be a fact. I grabbed a pry bar from the van and brought the crock pot outside. I walked out to the backyard and called, Hey Fido, come get some vittles you stupid son of a bitch. The neighbor's dog comes barreling over the sticks, his snout to the fence. Happy as hell that I finally noticed him. I gave him a little taste of the stew off my finger. His tail was wagging, and he started jumping at the fence, barking and drooling and carrying on like the dumb fucking mutt that he was. I could see that no one was home over there, so I pried off a couple fence boards and let the mutt slip through onto my property. I lured him to my shed with the stew and set it on the floor. He was already wolfing it down as I closed the door. When it was gone, he scratched at the door and cried to be let out. I knew the process was going to take a while, so I went inside and drank some more booze while I paced around the house. I finished most of the bottle and I still couldn't feel it. All I could feel was this strange hum all through my body. I could swear my feet weren't touching the floor when I walked. Mr. Reinert paused his narrative to watch two sparrows pick away at the contents of the bird feeder with quick, darting movements. These two have been coming round pretty regular for a while now, he said. Crafty little buggers. They team up on the bigger birds and give them hell until they fly away. The dog, I prompted. The tiny smile that had bloomed on his lips while watching his feisty little sparrows wilted into a scowl. The dog, he echoed. I waited until five o'clock or so before I went out to check on him. 
He was lying on the floor, shaking like a leaf. I could see that his nose was bleeding. That's what happens, you know. They get ruptures and bleed out from the inside. Anyway, I'd seen enough. I couldn't let the mutt suffer no more, so I pulled out my flick knife and I... Okay. My voice was tight in my throat. I get it. Solemnly, Mr. Reinhardt intoned. There wasn't no pleasure in doing that. I had to do it. I had to be absolutely sure before I... Well... Before I took it the rest of the way. I was never an abusive man, Brent. Never was. But I couldn't stand for it, could I? No, sir. It was time for a reckoning. I was rinsing off my knife in the kitchen sink when the phone started to ring. Right away that otherworldly hum kicked off into high gear. I felt that maddening, burning itch flare up everywhere, in every fiber of my being, and I knew who it was before I even grabbed the phone. I picked up the handset and I didn't say nothing. I just waited. Finally, a voice says, Florence, is that you? Did you do it? Of course, it was Elton on the other end of the line, Mr. Reinhardt hissed. They were in it together, Elton and my wife. How could I not see it? They were plotting together to grind me down and bury me in the dirt. Oh, I saw red. I saw nothing but a curtain of red. But I held my tongue and I hung up the phone. There wasn't no point in wasting words. I grabbed my knife out of the sink and jumped in the van. I was just starting to back out when a cop car comes pulling up to block the driveway. An involuntary thank God dropped out of my mouth before I could stop it. Mr. Reinhardt looked amused. The cop was an old bull with a crew cut. Had a belly on him like a prize hog. He strolled up to my window with his hand on his holster and says, Hello, sir. How are you today? Are you Douglas Reinert? I says, Maybe I am. Why? The cop nods like he expected something like that and goes, I'm investigating a serious assault and possible kidnapping. Are you Douglas Reinert, sir? Is this your van? I smiled to myself and said, It is. And I am. Are you accusing me of something? The cop nods to himself again and slaps his hand down on the roof. He says, Can you step out of the vehicle, please? Come on out. Well, I'm sitting there and looking at this cocksucker smiling away at me, and I knew. Mr. Reiner chuckled. I knew that Elton paid the son of a bitch to come finish me off. He wasn't investigating a goddamn thing. He was there to execute me. Make up some story later. Who would give a shit? The papers would all say I was a maniac on the loose. No one would ever know the truth. They'd probably give him the key to the city for gunning me down. So I tell him, Sure, officer. Whatever you say. I reached for the door handle with one hand while I snuck my knife out with the other. He stepped back to give himself some room. And as soon as I got out of the van, he pulled his gun on me. We looked at each other dead in the eye. And he says to me, We're going in the house now, Douglas. Walk. Make any sudden movements and I'll shoot you in the back. I asked, How much did he pay you? And the cop blinked at me in surprise. Turn around and walk into the house, he says again. I laughed at him and said, they tried to drive me crazy and it didn't work. They tried to poison me and it didn't work. Now this. Fuck you. And fuck them too. You can go ahead and do your dirty business right here in the goddamn driveway. The cop wipes the sweat off his forehead with his free hand and barks at me. I told you to turn your ass around and walk in that house, boy. Get moving. I was lunging for him before he'd even finished his sentence. Mr. Reiner cackled. 
I knew he was about to pull that trigger before he did, and I shifted just a little bit to the left, just in time. I felt the breeze from the bullet part my hair. And then I had him. He tried to fight me, but it didn't do no good. I was humming on a higher cycle. I was ten feet tall and faster than the wind. I slammed him up against the van and I held him there with one hand while I jabbed the knife in his belly. He screamed, Oh, Jesus! and tried to push me back, but he was alone and I had the strength of thousands. I held him there and stuck him like a sewing machine. When I let him drop, his guts were hanging out, and his eyes looked like a couple of glass marbles all shiny and blank. I stared at him mutely, trying to process it all. I saw that Mr. Reinert was looking noticeably worse as his story wore on, which was no mean feat when you consider how terrible he'd already looked at the start. I was starting to feel pretty bad myself. It was almost as if the hatred and sick paranoia had somehow made the very air around us become toxic. I could fully understand why Marla was looking forward to his demise. Mr. Reiner was poison. What did you do with, you know, the body? I asked. The old man shrugged and took a long swallow from the can. I tossed it in the trunk of the cruiser, he said, pulled it out of my way and left it on the side of the road. I knew they would be coming for me. I didn't care. My life was already ruined. The only thing left was to even the score. A reckoning, I said. He gave me a solemn tilt of his chin and a nod. I backed up to a puddle of blood and left my driveway for the last time. It was time for a long overdue chat with my good friend Elton Hyde, and then I'd be off to have a word with the missus. And after that, Mr. Reiner gazed out the window with a wistful expression, a caged bird who had never truly been free. I figured there wasn't going to be an after, he finished. He looked exhausted. That's where I was wrong. There was an after. And it's been dragging on me for much too long, Brent. I'm glad that it's almost over. I'm so goddamn glad. I glanced at the clock on the wall and was surprised to see that it was almost two o'clock. I'd been listening to Mr. Reiner talk for over an hour. My ass was starting to get numb and I'd never wanted some fresh air so badly in my life, but Mr. Reinert's tale was drawing to its tragically inevitable conclusion. I would soon be free to escape his odious sphere of influence. I didn't bother sneaking around this time, he said. I just pulled right into his driveway and walked up to his front door. I knew he was in there, and he was expecting me. That was fine with me. It wouldn't make no difference at all. He was one man, and I was legion. I was ten feet tall and faster than the wind. I could hear the clouds scraping the sky, and I could see every single pore in the concrete under my feet. And I knew, Brent. Mr. Reiner tapped a bony finger against his temple. I knew things no man has any right to know. There was random information flying in and out of my head. Stuff about people and places and all kinds of things. I knew the front door wouldn't be locked. And sure enough, it wasn't. I stepped out of the heat and right into a wall of cold. Elt had himself some central air, that's a fact. I walked into his living room and dragged my knife across his big leather couch. And I yelled, Come on out here, fat boy. Don't make me come looking for you. 
It weren't long before Outen comes stepping out from behind some fancy French doors, and I'll be damned if he didn't have a big smile on his face. I told him, You got nothing to smile about, you son of a bitch. Me and you are gonna settle the score. Elton just smiles even bigger and beckons me to follow him. He says, I got something you need to see. He slips back through the sliding doors and I rush after him, faster than the wind and humming like a live wire. I went after him, and I saw him standing at the end of a long hallway. He was peeking through another door and smiling away to himself. <coughs> he puts his fingers across his lips. And he motions for me to come have a look. <coughs> <coughs> Mr. Reinhardt's words screeched to a phlegm choked hole, and he inhaled with careful, controlled desperation from his cylinder. All at once, he panted. I feel this hot, ripping agony all over my body. I had enough time to say, Oh, sweet Jesus. And then they were spraying out of me like a fucking fire hose. My ears, my mouth, every which way they came in, that's how they left. I tried to scream, but I was choking on them. I couldn't even fall down. I was frozen right on the spot by the sheer force of it. I was shaking like I was being electrocuted. When it stopped, their power, their confidence... It was gone in an instant, and I was all alone in the world, alone and scared, and I didn't want to see what was in that room, not at all. Mr. Reinert lifted the can to his lips with a trembling hand. It sloshed over the rim and spattered his pants with foam. He threw it at the window with a curse. The impact made the glass shiver. Outside, the birds at the feeder exploded in a panic of cascading feathers. Nope. Not one bit. He gasped. Elton acted as if he didn't see none of that happen. He looked back at me and said, Come on, come see this. I shuffled down that hallway all alone and I forced myself to look through the door. It was Elton's bedroom. He had this king-size bed in there, you know, with four posts and a big walnut headboard, and who do you think was sleeping in that bed? Who do you think was all nestled down in there, sleeping snug as a bug in another man's bed? I said, it was your wife, and was surprised by the hoarseness in my voice. Mr. Reinhardt nodded slightly and tried to keep his lip from trembling. A trail of tears slipped down the gaunt plains of his cheeks. He didn't bother to wipe them away. I stumbled back and Elton pushed me down the hall with that smile of his, just marched at me and shoved me along with that shit-eating grin until I was cowering against his front door. He says she was never yours. Those kids aren't yours either. Nothing was ever yours. It always belonged to me. Now get your sorry ass out of my house and don't you ever come back. And then he grabbed me by the scruff of the neck, the son of a bitch. And he threw me out. Mr. Reiner buried his face in his hands. His wire-thin body quaked with the ferocity of his sobs. It was an ugly thing to see, but I didn't look away. Reckoning, he wept. Oh, there was a reckoning, you bet there was. Only it was me on the receiving end, wasn't it? I crawled to my van on my hands and knees. I didn't even have the strength to stand. I drove back out to the gravel pit and sat in the shade of a sumac tree. And I was alone, Brent. I was alone as any man has ever been alone in this world. The spiders had abandoned me, but they left their darkness behind. 
I sat by myself in that darkness until later that night, and then I drove back to Elton's house. I dumped some hardware out of a couple glass jars, and then I filled the jars with gasoline. That was enough. I sat up straight and shouted, No! No more! I'm not doing this! I rose to my feet, but Mr. Reinert nailed me in place with his red-eyed glare and kept right on talking. It went up fast. Mr. Reinert wheezed. Real fast. No one got out. I watched and made sure they didn't. The fire department didn't even notice I was hanging around, but some cop eventually wandered over and asked me what I was doing there. I told him I was watching the fire. He shakes his head at me and says, Get the fuck out of here, weirdo. Just then, another cop wandered up to get a better look at me, and he yells, Hey, wait a second, Hank. Grab him. Grab that motherfucker. He's the guy. So I jumped on Officer Hank, and I tried to get his gun. The old man murmured. I almost had it, too. But the other one shot me. He pointed at a spot just beneath his left collarbone. Hit me right there, he said. I went down. He wanted to put another one in my skull, but Officer Hank wrestled his gun away. I was put on trial for five counts of murder. I asked, five? How was there? And then it hit me like a slap. Florence hadn't taken the kids to her mother's house after all. Mr. Reiner burned his own children alive. Mr. Reiner closed his eyes and said, My lawyer told me if I didn't plead insanity I'd never be free again. I told him I wasn't crazy. I told them all I wasn't crazy. But no one believed it. They had everything all mixed up, see? They said I found out about my wife's affair and I snapped. They said that kid was a drifter, and he never even knew Elton Hyde. The cop I killed in my driveway was supposedly out interviewing suspects in the kid's disappearance. But that was just a story they made up to hide the truth. He came there to kill me. The old man glared bitterly out the window and added, Hell. They went so far as to say that I forced the neighbor's dog to eat an entire box of decon. And that's not how it happened at all. He said I poured it down the mutt's throat before I stabbed him to death. But that was all wrong. God damn them. I know. I've always not... But you don't know. I interrupted. And I was gratified to see the old man's expression change when he realized that his time was up. The session was over. The confessional was closed and the power balance between us had tilted out of his favor. His pallid face flushed a faint rose color and he blustered, Listen to me, shithead! You don't listen to yourself! I snapped, and despite my aversion to the thought of touching him, I had to resist the urge to throttle the man right then and there. You don't fucking know! None of this makes any sense! Why would Elton try to call your wife at your house if she was already asleep in his bed? Why would she try to poison you if she'd already run away to safety? Because she was... What? Because she was evil? Come on, man. There's nothing but why at every turn. And you don't have an answer for any of it. You're delusional, Mr. Reinert. You're sick. Fucking face it already, man. Jesus Christ. Mr. Reiner met my eyes with an even gaze and said, I thought they were all gone, but they weren't. Not entirely. Some of them stayed behind. It wasn't me who burnt that house down. It was them. When they ran out of the room at the hospital and kicked me out in the street, the spiders kept me alive. I'd done some bad things over the years, it's true. But I also done some things that only seemed like they were bad. I always knew more than I should. More than any man should. They were always a part of me. And now that I'm dying, Mr. Reinert smiled a reaper's smile, and he tapped himself on the chest. 
now that I'm dying, they're dying too. He brought his hands to his mouth and hacked up a lungful of his inner decay. With a malevolent twinkle in his eye, Mr. Reinhardt raised his cupped hands to me like a chalice and said, See for yourself. I looked down into the hollow between his palms and uttered a shrill scream. I tripped over my chair and fell to the floor with a wham that shook the walls. My flailing hand slapped Mr. Reinert's garbage can as I hit the carpet, knocking it over and spilling its contents everywhere. There was something weakly struggling in the thick ooze that Mr. Reinhardt had gleefully held out for my inspection. I don't know what it was, but I can say that it almost looked like a spider. Not really, but it was close. If you understand what I mean. It was close enough. The things that came crawling out of the garbage can looked much the same. Although I couldn't really say for sure because I was already running out the door before I even knew that I was back on my feet. I left my tools behind. I pounded down the stairs and shoved Marla aside when she tried to get in my way. She went sprawling with a squawk of surprised indignation. And I was out of there, sprinting for the van and squealing away from the curb with a pedal to the floor. I went back to the shop and told Sal that I was done. He chased me out to the parking lot, puffing with the exertion of hauling his bulk at such a brisk pace, and he demanded I tell him why I was quitting. I had nothing more to say. I was just done, and that was all. I jumped in my car and drove off with Sal still yelling at me in the rear view mirror, and that was the last I ever saw of him. I was done. I would never work as an electrician again. I became an accountant instead. I mostly do personal taxes and small business stuff. It's easy work, and the money's nice. I flushed the pills a long time ago, and that was that. I've walked the straight and narrow ever since. Life is simpler now. And I'd like to think that I'm happy. However, I do have one rule that I follow religiously. No matter what. No basements. Not ever. I avoid all basements like the plague. That's where the spiders are. The air is filled with smoke, but to Texan farmer Dan Murphy, it was all part of his daily routine. Unlike most men, Don lived for his work days. Even at 57, he never grew tired of the fragment fog of burning wood, the vast blue skies, and the rich biting taste of the honey his bees tirelessly produced. It certainly wasn't the highest paying job, but any job that involved going outside and interacting with nature was good enough for him. There were other beekeepers in his town, but Don Murphy was a titan among them. He often joked that half his job consisted of supervising apiaries other than his own. Of all his peers, his colonies were the strongest. They accepted new queens most readily, and their combs practically bled the golden brown stuff. It always humored him how bipolar the attitudes people held toward bees were. Don knew full well that the very same people who bought jars upon jars of honey from him also complained on a weekly basis about the swarms of bees invading their backyards. At least they made up the vast majority of ill will directed toward him, the ones going off about their flowers, their honey, were the most difficult to manage. 
When all was said and done, they were just folks looking to weasel their way out of another Jew in life. Don valued paying his Jews with hard work, the timeless equation of input plus effort equaling output. The greater satisfaction of knowing his toils ultimately made a difference. I'm one to talk, he thought with a smirk, as he smoked out his first hive. Is it really work if you enjoy it? Ignoring the befuddled bees crawling around his mesh visor, he removed the lid from the hive and pulled out a raft, smiling as he saw both sides were almost completely capped over with beeswax. First go, good job, everyone, he said, depositing the raft into a wheelbarrow. The remainder of the rafts were only half capped, better to let them fill up entirely before harvesting. Don covered the wheelbarrow with a tarp before moving on to the next one. He pumped a fresh round of smoke in and around the openings before taking the lid off and lifting up a raft. Oh, Jesus, no. The raft was also coated with beeswax, but only about six adult bees were attached. Instead of crawling among the combs doing their business, they merely hung on, antenna waving feebly, as if they'd simply lost the will to continue working. God damn it, no! Don muttered, pulling out another raft where he could only see two. The panic caused his skin to prickle as he moved toward a third raft and witnessed, with a plummeting heart, the nail in the coffin for his hive. The queen, recognizable from her plump size and painted thorax, Likewise clung lifelessly onto the raft. Normally the queen was always surrounded by a convoy of worker bees cleaning her, communicating with her. But aside from the defining traits, she might as well have been one more torpid bug in the hive. CCD, Don thought with a ch sinking chill. Colony collapse disorder, the mysterious condition of bees abandoning their hives and venturing aimlessly beyond their range, where they all perished in purposeless confusion. The theories regarding CCD were as varied as the answers were few. The only certain thing about it was the frustration and fear that plagued any and all afflicted beekeepers. Why you all had to go? Don sighed before removing all the rafts and stowing them in the wheelbarrow. The colony had truly gone its way. He might as well reap what he could from them. As he moved to the next hive, a flicker of movement atop a distant hill caught his eye. Squinting through the mesh, he could make out a blurry dot skirting near the crest, obscured by a layer of dry scrub. Coyotes and badgers were the most common interlopers on his property, but this thing's height and gait could only mean one thing. Don dropped the wheelbarrow and drew his revolver from his waistline. You're on private property, he bellowed out at the figure. Get the hell out of here. I'm well within my rights to shoot. The thing stopped and shifted, as if turning towards him. Don inched closer, unable still to make out a face. Turn back now. The loss of one of his hives had incensed him to the point of spitting with fury, directing his rage toward the trespasser. Three seconds! The figure seemed to bend over, then straightened up again, rocking back and forth. A gust of dry wind punched in Don's direction, and with it carried the sound of mocking laughter. Don pulled the trigger, and he fell into a split-second shock from the crack of the gun. But he ripped off his mask and stared wildly at where the figure once was. Breathing heavily, he tore through the apiary and up the hill, his bee suit catching on brambles and thorns. A stitch in his side, he arrived at the spot, looking around for any sign of an intruder. Footprints, hair, anything. Nothing. Don emitted a ragged sigh and trudged back. Despite his anger, he knew the trespasser had nothing to do with his hive. Bees would first die attempting to deter an intruder before they went so far as to abandon their home. 
But as he maneuvered the wheelbarrow among the rest of the hives, he wondered offhandedly how much more strangeness he'd had to put up with. Later that evening, Don and his wife Janine oversaw the extraction of the harvested honey in their garage. A brief spin in a hand-powered centrifuge sucked the liquid from the rass, which drained through a spigot and through a sieve to catch any errant bits of wax. Despite the drama from earlier in the day, it was a decent haul, nearly four jars worth. A2 died today. Don grunted, tying the signature red bow around the jar. Open it up, and damn near nobody was home. Never knew a bee could look depressed, but now I know. Janine lowered her head. She too knew of CCD. Why do they do that, Don? Wish I knew, he replied. If I did, though, they might kill me for owning such knowledge. Janine set her jar aside. I mean, if it ain't parasites or disease or chemicals... Could they just up and decide to leave? Decide? The word, in that context, felt like a foreign language on Don's tongue. There's a reason it's called a hive mind. Bees have no free will of their own. They'll stick to their queen until their dying breath. Apparently not. That don't mean they're not physically capable of leaving. Janine countered. If they think something's wrong, they'll jump ship. That's not free will, that's instinct. Come off it, Janine, said Don. They have nowhere to go and they die soon after. What's the point of that instinct? Janine shrugged, looking away. Maybe some things are worse than that. Don scoffed. Well, maybe when you get out there in the sun working with me, you can lecture me on the workings of bees. I'm not getting into this now, Janine snapped an edge to her tone. She tied off the last jar and strode back into the house. I'm going to bed. Don heard her angry footsteps going up the stairs and settling in their bedroom. He shook his head and grabbed a beer from the fridge, figuring he ought to cool down even more before joining her in bed. He walked out back and settled on his chair, overlooking the desert night. The stars never failed to impress him. A liquid wash of celestial fire in the sky above. The distant buzz of bee activity had finally died down. Bees often worked into the night, but even they had to sleep at some point. The porch light above him dimmed and he heard the clatter of insect wings. No, please, no, Don moaned, looking up. Bees affected with a parasitic maggot would often hurl themselves into lights at night, for similarly unknown reasons. Pathogenic brainworms were the last thing Don wanted to deal with after CCD. But the thing smacking itself against the light was no bee. It was much larger, about the size of his thumb, its wings clacking sickingly on the glass. It circled erratically like a carp on a line rendering it difficult to focus on. Don could make out a burnt orange color in black stripes and dark, waspy eyes. Perhaps a western cicada killer, relatively innocuous despite its name. Regardless, the thing was interfering with his peaceful night, so Don reached over and switched the porch light off. Silence came creeping back, and Don leaned back in his chair, taking a drink savoring the beer's sweet prickly pear flavor. Listening out, Don heard nothing in the bushes beyond. He smirked. Whoever that was would not come back after being shot at. Sometimes you just gotta let some things speak for themselves, he thought, going for another sip. He shot up from his chair and sputtered frantically as the bottle touched his mouth and three pairs of clawed legs grabbed onto his lower lip. He swatted at his face, dropping the beer, backing up and tripping over his chair. He made contact with something hard and sharp, but not before a shooting pain spiked the corner of his mouth. Shit, he spat, scrambling inside the house, slamming the screen door shut. He hobbled to the bathroom, turning the light on, examining his injured lip in the mirror. 
Blood oozed from the sting, which seethed on the sensitive skin. He cursed at his stupidity, remembering that pollinating insects were often attracted to fruity aromas. Now he would have to look forward to a swollen face in the morning. Yes, yeah, serves me right for being an asshole to Janine, he thought bitterly. But as he watched, the wound continued to sear without the debilitating crawl of injected venom. Don stared at his reflection for a solid ten minutes before going to rub his lip. It hurt, but he concluded it was nothing more than a flesh wound. Strange, he muttered. Looking closer, he saw that instead of swelling, the flesh had been cleaved away, as if from a pair of mandibles. What bit me? He asked himself. Cicada killers certainly didn't bite. Don didn't know of any other insect nests in and around the property. Whatever it was, it was nothing he'd seen before. He washed out the wound with soap and water, squeezing the remaining blood out before dabbing it away and heading up for bed. Everything that day had been so sudden, so fucking weird. Don hoped he would find better respite in his dreams. A buzzing woke him up. Don shot up in his bed, yelping in panic, his lip pulsing with soreness. Then he realized his smartphone was merely vibrating on the nightstand. He picked it up and answered sleepily. Don Murphy. Don? It's Carla. His neighbor down the road was a regular who used his honey for baking. I'm uh, going to need another jar soon. Don's brow furrowed. We have plenty in stock right now. You can come on over any time. I did, Carla replied. I tried going up to your door earlier this morning, but your bees kept coming at me. One of them landed in my hair, and I said, Nope, and turned right around back home. Nah, that couldn't have been, said Don, rubbing his temples. My bees don't attack people. Well, something did, said Carla, rather sassily. I'm not coming over there again, but if you'd like to bring a jar over to my place, I'd gladly accept that. Okay, sure. Goodbye. Don hung up and immediately went for his bee suit, slipping into it. He had a pretty shrewd suspicion as to what it was that attacked Carla. Janine peered drowsily at him from her spot in the bed. What's the matter, Don? Hopefully nothing. He growled, fastening his mask on. I'm just going to check something. Before his wife could follow up, he was down the stairs and bursting through the front door. The morning sun blinded him, but he couldn't see anything flying around. He examined the potted flowers, the corners of the patio, and the bushes out front. He looked up into the air to empty, cloudless skies. Then, on another gust of dry wind, came the sound of his bees buzzing. They seemed louder than normal and deeper. Shit! Don hissed, rushing around the back of his house to the yard. He rounded the corner and halted when he saw the entire apiary was storming with furious honeybees, battering Don's suit, some trying to sting him. Don brushed them off and charged into the fray. They were all hopped up on defensive pheromones, driven wild with a desire to go after anything that resembled a threat. As to what that threat was, he stopped dead when he saw it. Surprise Hive, A1, had been bored with jagged holes, and bees were swarming in and out of them, looping erratically around a posse of bulky, demonic hornets that were chewing their way in. Their color and sound matched the mystery bug from the night before. As Don watched in horror, the hornets simply hooked bees with their legs and decapitated them in one fluid motion, discarding their wriggling bodies to the ground below. Don exploded with a scream when he saw what laid on the ground. A virtual carpet of dying honeybees, almost all missing their heads, crawling listlessly over each other, tangling in each other's splattered innards. The hornets were emerging from the hive now, their mandibles stuffed with honey and larva, which they devoured right before Don's eyes. Don bellowed and ran to the porch, 
where he grabbed a shovel and sprinted back to the hive, whacking and swinging with all his might. Solid metallic thunks assured him he had hit his mark, but the remaining hornet swirled up in a spiral and descended upon him like predatory birds. Their claws digging in, they bit into his suit and stabbed him with their stingers. Only a few hit skin around his ankles, but Don cried out in agony as the pain exploded in his feet, scorching like bullets of fire. He stamped and jumped, squashing the bugs, which burst their engorged guts over his clothes. He ran back toward the house, throwing open the screen door and slamming it shut. What happened, Don? Are you okay? Janine screamed as she bolted down the stairs. Don fell to the floor, clutching his ankles, blowing air through his gritted teeth. Close the door, the glass door, close it, he rasped. Hornets landed one by one on the mesh panel, burrowing their thick mandibles through, biting lesions through it. Get out of the way, Janine said, grabbing hold of the door. Don scooted along the floor, groaning as Janine finally slammed the glass door, locking it for good measure. The hornets gathered on the outside, their buzzing vengeful and devilish. Are the windows closed? Don demanded. Yes, they're all closed. Janine confirmed. Jesus Christ, Don. What the hell are those? Don tried to bring himself to his hands and knees, but a wave of dizziness struck him, and he fell backward to the floor and vomited. The pain was shooting electricity up his bones, invoking spasms clouding his head. His last flash of rationale told him he'd only been stung twice or thrice, not nearly enough to cause serious damage. As tears squeezed through his eyes, he shot one last glance through the glass at his ravaged apiary and saw a man standing among the swarm. He was barefoot and fully covered with animal pelts, his eyes wide and white, and his mouth was unhinged in laughter. And the sound of it seeped through the glass, and Don convulsed again as he suddenly recognized that laugh. The jeering noise followed him into unconsciousness, and he slipped away into a void of hellish black. On the couch, Don came around, feeling as though baseballs had been stuffed under the skin of his ankles. He leaned up and saw both feet sported two swollen red lumps. Janine had pulled up an ottoman futon and was applying a hydrocortisone cream to his wounds. Take this, she said tenderly, handing him a pill and a glass of water. Don swallowed the pill without taking a drink. The hives, he croaked, looking at his wife. She shook her head. They're, they're gone. But they were at it for hours. Don's head fell back onto the cushion as he stared unseeingly into space. Ten years of management and upkeep, of connections and dealings, gone in the span of hours. Those things were some kind of hornet, he said. I've never seen anything like them before. I have, said Janine. Don looked at her and she blinked. No, I'm sorry. I mean, I found them online. Look. She unlocked her smartphone and showed the screen to Don, who craned his neck for a better angle. A blown-up picture of one of the hornets dominated the screen, its eyes black and sinister, jaws splayed in a threatening pose. Vespa Mandarina, read Don. Asian giant hornet. I, yes, I've heard of those too. But what are they doing in Texas? And so many of them, at least a hive's worth. I was doing more research, Janine said. You were out a long time. They began turning up on the West Coast a few years back. Everyone thought they were isolated occurrences, but now I'm paying for it, said Don. Those things showed up and destroyed my work. I... We're, we're ruined. Don, I'm sorry, but surely we can start over, can't we? No. Don swung his feet onto the floor and yelped as he put pressure on them. If these things propagate and spread, there won't be anything to start over with. They were systematic. 
how they butchered my bees. Like, that's what they're evolved to do. These things are a goddamn death warrant for people like us. So what are we going to do then? Janine demanded. We'll have to get rid of them. Don stood shakily to his feet, wincing from the burning agony. Spread the word. Start calling people. Friends, family, neighbors. He began pacing in place, working the pains out of his feet. If they're really gone, we need pictures of the hives. That'll get people talking, that's for damn sure. Don, there's one more thing. Janine said softly. Don looked at her. What? Janine pointed behind him to the glass back door. Overcome with dread, Don turned around and looked. Smeared on the outside of the glass were letters. Sickly yellow, studded with black specks. Don inched forward down the hallway, staring at disbelief at the words on the door. Find me. Don mouthed the words to himself. The image of that skin-clad man and the swarm suddenly striking through his mind. He turned and looked at his wife, who stared back at him, her expression one of unsettled confusion. Someone's doing this to us, he declared. Someone set those things on us. I... but why? Would you know this person? Janine inquired. No. I can't imagine anyone who'd do this to us said Don, resuming his manic pacing. We need to call the police, then, said Janine, pulling out her phone. No, Don commanded. That won't do. They're... Or we can't pin him to the hornets. All I can say is that he was trespassing. And the police won't do shit about the hornets, even if they could find out where they've gone. Don hobbled to the glass door, pulling his boots from the closet. I've worked too long and too hard to let this all go to waste. He fondled the top shelf, feeling around until he found his revolver. There's no one to blame for this, but that don't mean I can't do nothing about it. I'm going with you, said Janine, walking toward him. No, you're not, Don snapped. What if it's a trap? You stay here and watch the house, and if I'm not back in an hour, then you call the police. Don, Janine said simply. You and me are in this together. I'm coming with. That man's a fucking psychopath, Don shouted, advancing towards her. I'm not going to have you gutted or raped or whatever the fuck's on his mind. He tightened his grip on the revolver. I forbid you. Janine's face tightened. I don't need you to be a hero, Donald. I need you to be a husband. I am. He opened the glass door and slammed it in her face. I'm taking back our lives, because that's what I have to do. He holstered the gun and turned his back on her. Don had to fight back tears as he passed through the remains of his apiary. Half of his hives had been brutalized, each with their own mass killing of bees long dead. The other hives appeared to have been untouched, but Don walked up to one and flung the lid off, lifting a raft. Just as he thought, only a few benumbed workers and a single queen remained. They left, he said. Rather die starving and alone than face what was coming. He hesitated. How long have they been gone? During or after the assault? Or, he shuddered with forbearing, before... A rattling emanated from one of the damaged hives. The lid jerked as if something was pushing from underneath, and a single hornet crawled onto the top, coated in honey and the soiled corpses of baby bees, absent-mindedly chewing on one as it stared blankly at Don. Don stared back, drew his gun and fired. The lid blasted off and... What little remained of the hornet's mangled body fell softly to the ground. That's the least you deserve, he thought bitterly, pounding up the hill. 
The late afternoon sun beat down on him as he walked, scanning the vast, shrub-ridden desert, dyeing the rocks red and setting a haze in the distance. Don ruefully regretted not bringing a canister of water. He'd been more preoccupied with raining hell upon the marauder than considering his own health. His sweaty jeans chaffed at his skin. His brain felt full of dusty air. But he kept his gaze on the horizon, determined to seek out the bastard, where he was hiding, and how he was controlling so many hyper-aggressive insects. Something buzzed past the back of his neck and he jolted, swatting reflexively. A hornet had zoomed past him and settled deep within a grove of desert scrub. The longer Don watched, the clearer he could hear a monotonous hum, as if hundreds of bugs were moving in unison. Let's see what the fuck kind of hive you're keeping, Don said, turning and heading for the grove. The branches were thick and bunched up against each other. He had to grab and break them away until he could squeeze through a gap. He emerged into a stony clearing and startled, drawing his gun. I wouldn't take that shot, or else it would be your last. The apparition sneered. Don stowed the gun and glared at the man before him. Up close, underneath the shroud of pelts, Don could see he was very old, with sunbaked skin and deep wrinkles. A rabbit skin hood obscured most of his face, but Don could make out yellow teeth in those same crazy eyes. Who the hell are you, and why are you so keen on destroying us? The old man snickered, rocking back and forth in spastic laughter. I have nothing against you, sir. You, Don leveled the gun again, you set those murder hornets on our property and killed every last one of our bees. I am far within my rights to kill you dead. Still your wrath the old man said. No matter what comes out of this little powwow, I'm afraid you'll face the losing end. I suggest you see it through. Don kept his gun aimed at him, but his arm began to shake as fresh sweat beaded on his forehead. Who are you? That's immaterial. The old man laughed. But what I am? I am Yi Nadlushi. Only an agent of the inevitable. Caught on nature's sweeping tide. What the hell does that mean? Don shouted. Colonial arrogance at its most naked, said the old man. So concerned with molding this good earth like children playing with clay. Woefully ignorant to the whim of the great mother. Don fingered the trigger. Start talking sense. The old man leered, eyeing him for an ugly moment. You and I are a lot alike in some ways, he finally said. I, too, loathe the arrival of these winged devils. He overturned his hand and a hornet crawled from inside his sleeve, settling in his palm. When they came, when they enacted their scourge, I asked myself, how could this have happened? What did we do to deserve such unholy misery? His head twitched and his neck gave a gnarly crunch. But I reminded myself each action must have a consequence. And this is no more apparent than in the colonial arrogance I endure each and every day. He bared his decrepit teeth at dawn. When you spread your roots and shook hands with the rest of the world, did you really not expect to transmit a few germs? As Don listened with disgust, he realized that the buzzing, at first silenced, had begun to well up again. But the old man continued to talk. When you dig a canal, the water flows and things change forever. That is not a result of your ingenuity. That is just nature taking its course. What is happening here is nature taking its course. No matter how wicked and backwards that may be. He grinned again. That is where you and I are very different. You are a suppressor. I am its emissary. 
you you did this because we think we're above nature don figured the buzzing had grown louder he had to shout to make himself heard but i'm a beekeeper bees are endangered as they are i keep them they pollinate and thrive how am i the bad guy why do i deserve this swallow your vanity the old man snarled you did nothing to deserve this all i've done is ensure the consequences your bees were smart enough to leave their hives because they too went with nature's course and you standing in its way propped up tall with your pride will suffer the humiliating indignity of don shot the old man he shuddered from the impact his face frozen in mid-speech some yellow glutinous juice frothed at his lips his body gave an almighty tremor and his pelts fell to the ground. Don let out a piercing shriek. The old man's bare skin from the neck down was peppered with a geometric pattern of holes, the texture of honeycomb, and crawling in and out of the flesh were thousands of hornets, the source of intensifying buzz. His eyes degraded into jelly, and two hornets burst forth from them scuttling over his bald scalp, but the thing still cracked a smile. I warned you, it would be your last. Don scooted backwards, distancing himself from the creature, but it shambled towards him, trembling at its knees. I am Chaos, skinwalker to the winged devils. His voice was amplified and garbled, as if filtered through the hornets themselves. And while whittling through his powwow, I've unleashed chaos elsewhere, for such is its nature to strike with tenacious dispassion. No! Don bellowed, realizing instantly what he'd meant. He turned and crashed through the bushes, his feet blazing with fresh pain, limping as fast as he could back over the hill, where his house was, where his wife was. The buzzing hit an ungodly pitch behind him, and he upped his pace, threatening to trip and fall forward with each step. The settling sun was plunging the rocks into formless shadow. His foot struck a cactus, and he screamed, pushing forward against the spine in his toe. The hill was just ahead. He clambered up it and threw his gaze down the slope to his house, and beyond his ruined hives, motionless at the center of the house, the figure writhed on the ground, surrounded by a gyrating swarm of hornets. No! Janine! Don screamed. He tumbled down the hill in his haste, colliding with rocks and shrubs, sliding to stop among a field of gravel. Broken, scraped, and in excruciating pain, Don crawled on the ground, blubbering madly, tears mixing with the blood in his mouth. Janine! Please! No! He arrived at her side, riddled with pain, enduring fresh things, staring down in tear-stricken horror. His wife's clothes were soaked through with red pinpricks, and every inch of her exposed skin was covered with swollen, necrotic sores. His hand reached for her head, but he stopped himself. He wanted to remember his wife's face as it was, beautiful, clean, and unmarred, as the venom pumped through his blood, he summoned the last jolt of energy and staggered to his feet, stumbling for the porch door. He grabbed the handle, leaning forward on it, and collapsed inside, finally kicking it shut. Immediately, a hail of hornets drilled into the glass, their durable exoskeletons resounding in sickening thunks. They chewed at the glass so close Don could see their individual mouth parts flexing and glittering. Then they scurried beyond the door onto the outside walls. They'll get in. If they want to, they will. He hauled himself across the floor, his body racked with toxins, the furniture swimming freely in his vision. He ended up in the living room next to the couch Janine had treated him on, the water and medicine still sat on the table. 
Crawling towards it, he splashed the water in his face and downed a handful of antihistamines. It did nothing to quell the venom, but he could think Claire now. She was right. He whispered, his eyes reddened from crying. They knew. They fled, or at least some of them did. The hornet's buzz echoed down from up the chimney. Don turned his head to stare at it. Slumped against the futon, the bones in his limbs tingled uncomfortably, then fell limp beside him. The scatter plot of stings around his body flared with an acid kick, signifying his flesh had begun to dissolve. Something inhuman was creeping down the chimney, dripping its honeydewed blood. A few skulls had already emerged, hovering slowly above Don's shattered body, as if smelling his imminent death. Illuminated in a shaft of moonlight, the skinwalker reached its gangly arms from the chimney, dragging its way up the wall, gripping it with slender talons. A convoy of hornets clung to it like spiderlings. It twisted its neck to peer down at dawn. Pity, it drooled. You too tried to flee, defiant of nature to your dying breath. Admitted an insectoid chatter, Ignominy will be your coffin. Paralyzed from the neck down, Don tore his eyes away from the skinwalker, laying them instead on the medicine and water, the last things he saw Janine hold in her hands. His lips tightened with grief. He could still smell her perfume in the air, underneath the putrid scent of carrion and peat. Something laid on the floor next to the photon. Don squinted to focus on it. It was his smartphone. Don recalled the moment he'd come to. She was there, showing him that phone, relaying knowledge to him in her angelic voice. She knew about the hornets. She knew about CCD. She knew. Don turned again to face the creature. He could feel the stiffness rising up his throat. Nevertheless, he spoke up. And me, then. He gurgled. But one day... You'll have to face the inevitable. I am the inevitable, the skinwalker rasped. You may have beaten me, but there are others out there too. And like it or not, people are a part of nature too. Don drew one final breath into his blackening lungs. And when the chips are down, you'll find that those others will come roaring back. Once they know how to beat you. You think you're some freaking higher being. But you're part of this just like everything else. Everyone else. And once we know how to deal with you. Nature will, in due time, take its course. The skinwalker bared its teeth, its limbs trembling, with the effort to hold itself up. Don stared it down, forcing himself to remain lucid until the end. Kill! It hissed. As the hornets descended upon him, Donald Murphy felt the stirrings of something inscrutable and intangible, but somehow necessary, and all too real in spite of everything that had happened. Assurance. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.